First, we have the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, if we could all stand and face the flag. Before you sit down, I just have a, uh, you all know that Senator Weaver passed away, um, and I have a proclamation in his honor. It reads, uh, whereas Stan Weaver served residents of Urbana for over 45 years as mayor of Urbana, state representative, and state senator, and whereas Senator Weaver's accomplishments range from facilitating the opening of Lincoln Square Mall to unwavering support of the University of Illinois, an institution for which he secured over $1 billion in capital funding from the state of Illinois. And whereas Senator Weaver led in a quiet and effective way without bringing unnecessary attention to himself or his position, and whereas Senator Weaver's record of civic involvement and public service is an inspiration to our community, and whereas Senator Weaver passed away November 11, 2003, therefore I, Todd Satterthwaite, Mayor of Urbana, to hereby proclaim Monday, November 17, 2003, Stan Weaver Day in the city of Urbana, and encourage everyone to recognize his contributions to our community. Let's have a moment of silence. Thank you very much. This leadership will certainly be missed. See, first uh, we have on the agenda tonight approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. So moved. Second. So motion is second. Is there any, are there any additions or corrections? Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Next, um, additions or corrections to the agenda. Just uh, one that I know of, and that would be uh, under reports of standing committees, the uh, Committee of the Whole report, item F, um, we had a request to uh, pull that until the next uh, council meeting from uh, the university, or oh, from the county, I guess. So if we can, um, there's no objection, we'll take that off the agenda. Uh, any other uh, additions or corrections to the agenda this evening? Yes, Ms. Pat. The, actually, was there, was there a new agenda distributed? Yes. Okay. So we have an old business item, is that right? Right. In our case, okay. So, thank you. All right, yeah, somewhere. we're reading off the corrected agenda, if anybody has the old one. Agenda. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll move on to uh, petitions and communications. Uh, first, we have uh, Peter Milberg um, representing Illinois Power. Peter here. He's outside. Is he being interviewed? Yeah, he is. Uh, we'll get him in a little bit. Um, uh, Joan Zagorski, 1605 South Race on the MOR. Joan? Joan here? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, would you like to? Did you want to speak? Well, so just the luck of the draw. I'm Joan Zagorski, I live at 1605 South Race, and um, I wrote down this, so I'm going to read it. The most important goal is to save as many of our old houses, our historical, our, our, our architectural heritage, and keep them from being demolished for not very good reasons, which means not being maintained and being allowed to fall into great disrepair. It is important to raise the demolition, demolition fee a lot to discourage this destruction. The fee should be contingent on the number of apartment units planned for the new building. The more units, the more the demolition fee. I also believe that before any house is allowed to be demolished, it needs to be given great scrutiny to first save it if possible, and second, to have a plan of complete approval if indeed a new building is to be built. 
This approval should include all of the design criteria, that is, harmony of size and architectural detail, compatible with our old existing buildings. This all needs to be done before one step is taken to, be, to demolish. I just hope the new ordinances will have the power behind them to stop this relentless destruction and building of these massive, ugly apartment buildings. The original ordinance states that the objectives of Developmental Review Board are to encourage the maintenance, preservation, and enhancement of both individual structures and the neighborhood's visual and aesthetic character and to encourage the economic use of older structures in a manner compatible with the neighborhood. <coughs> it seems there was no power in these ordinances to save 605, 611, and 701 Green Street. The other suggestion was to create incentives to Green Street houses and older houses for single family occupancy. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hey, thank you. <coughs> Next is Liz Cardman, 708 West California on EMOR. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'll have to read and see what I can get into my five minutes. I received an email from Emily Tallon, a professor of urban and regional planning at the U of I. And I understand that all council members were forward, uh, forwarded a copy of her email. I have her permission to quote from it. In it, she articulates quite well current theories in urban planning to decrease sprawl by focusing on, quote, unquote, infill development in ways that limit outward spread, create a better sense of place, provide better proximity of services to local residents, and generally contribute to smart growth principles. End quote. As insightful as these general principles are, I believe they are not an accurate model for the unique situation of Urbana. First, in this area, the most significant amount of sprawl and acreage is for big box businesses and housing developments with large homes. The trend for either of these types of sprawl will not be offset by infill development within the MOR. Second, Given who owns property in the MOR and the proximity of the area to campus, at best what we can expect in new development are large apartment buildings for students. A manager specializing in student rentals once referred to property near campus as the equivalent of oceanfront property. Such property is a cash cow, cheap to build and a no-risk, highly lucrative investment. I hope you'll be honest with yourselves and admit that Urbana is not going to get upscale development in the MRR or the riskier investment of a building with commercial use on the ground floor and residential units above. Even should pricier condos be built, they will readily become student rentals as has happened with Campus Oaks at 502 West Green. Third, I surveyed some 90 properties on Green and Elm that are within the MOR. This is not 100% accurate, but it is on target. I estimated that if every residential property were raised and a building maximizing the number of units that could fit within the roughly 6,000 square footage allowed, the number of residents would increase from roughly 500 to 1,000. My calculations were based on the very generous, though false, assumption that every plat could support the equivalent of what is being built at 611 West Stream. I ask you, what businesses what business is going to move into downtown or Lincoln Square simply because there are 500 more residents in the area for eight months of the year? The fact is, new housing for an additional 500 residents will not, to use Professor Talon's words, quote unquote, create a better sense of place. Rather, these new units will have a very corrosive effect on the single family neighborhood to the south. This neighborhood is already somewhat fragile. If you doubt the impact of student housing adjacent to a single-family residential neighborhood, I invite you to stroll along Busey from Florida north to University. You'll see the gradual deterioration as you proceed. From a traditional all-single-family residential neighborhood, you'll first encounter numerous cars parked on the streets at all hours. Then you'll see cars parked all over 
once were back and side yards. You'll experience increasing amounts of litter and noise, then increasing numbers of poorly maintained rentals and even some abandoned properties. You'll also see increasing numbers of leasing now signs well into the new academic year. For the full impact of student housing, I invite you to visit what once was a single family residential neighborhood north of campus and see how it's degenerated into one cheap apartment building after another. Given the potential risk of allowing this to happen, I ask that you consider these amendments to the MOR ordinance. Because the original ordinance placed so much emphasis on the importance of acceptable design by requiring a unanimous vote, I believe that at a minimum, any decision of the newly restructured DRB require a two-thirds vote. Second, that local interests be maintained by, by requiring that the DRB include one resident living within the MOR as well as one resident living within 250 feet of the MOR. Third, that the issue of partial leasing be struck from the ordinance and deferred until you have design criteria in hand, at which point you can actually see what staff is recommending and not second guessing. Um, I also believe that there should be DRB approval of any site plan for an adaptive reuse project that involves substantially changing the appearance of an existing structure. Without that, you'd get 308 West Green. And I also think that a business owner on the DRB ought to be someone who owns a business with fewer than 40 employees. There are many misperceptions about new urbanism, but in this case, New urbanism is no more than maintaining what we already have in our older neighborhoods, such as West Urbana, a stable, viable residential neighborhood within walking distance of downtown and its amenities. Additional 500 part-time residents to jeopardize this neighborhood through thoughtless development is not worth it. Um, and lastly, I also want you to please consider inclusion of di design criteria within the ordinance without Without it, you will re merely have a shell of an ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> uh, next is uh, Peter Milberg, uh, representing Illinois Power. Peter. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, I apologize for my earlier inconveniencing. It's okay. Council. Um, I'll keep my remarks brief and, and focused on the, the uh, uh, ordinance before the city tonight regarding the uh, desire to res retain a consultant to look at options on the uh, electric supply. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate publicly Illinois Power's commitment to work with the cities uh, on this effort. Um, running an electric system uh, or gas <coughs> system for that matter is a very capital intensive and, and technically challenging process. Um, I concur with the comments that uh, Council uh, Holtz made, Councilor Holtz made, uh, with regard to uh, this effort being necessary to provide the council members and this, an objective viewpoint on what these issues are. Uh, I've heard over the past several weeks a lot of discussion, um, a lot of uh, misinformation just you know, offered simply because uh, people didn't have the background in this issue and, and, and in these operations. And so I think that the council's decision to pursue this option and generate some objective information is a desirable outcome. Uh, we have our commitment to work with you, um, and uh, I'm confident at the end you'll find that Illinois Power is your best option, especially in light of uh, the efforts we've been making to address some of the specific concerns of customers and, and the cities here uh, over in Champ over here in Urbana and Champaign. So, uh, extend my comments. If anyone has any questions, questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Lisa Truel, 714 West Iowa, on the changes to the MOR. Good evening. Uh, last time I was here to speak about the MOR district, I um, said that the most important thing was that we have the motto, no more New Yorkers. And one of the ways to avoid having a building built like the New Yorker with the kind of um, partially submerged parking with a um, 
burn of soil and grass on top of it um, is that you require tonight some changes to the ordinance and that is that you require the design criteria so that the that the citizen representation on the development review board be more than just a token representation and um, that it be a resident that lives within the MOR district and one living within 250 feet and then also make it required that a supermajority vote be required because right now the composition of the board is so weighted towards people who may have very strong financial ties to the development community that the only way that the citizens really do have any kind of voice would be to make it a supermajority vote. And then finally, I um, really encourage you to defer including un, um, partially submerged parking in the ordinance tonight until there's more information rega regarding the design criteria. Uh, last time that we were here two weeks ago when I heard that um, members of the disability community had come to the Common Council uh, asking that uh, partially submerged parking not be built with new construction because that's where typically the accessible uh, par um, apartments mm -hmm. are built. To me, I had come to last uh, time I'm speaking about the aesthetics of the partially submerged parking. But once I heard that, I felt that it was more important that new construction hold up the ideals of the American Disabilities Act and that we do really um, build new buildings that are truly accessible um, for all people. And it is the one minority that within the blink of the eye, every one of us tonight can become a part of. And I think that we really need to, um, to really heed that message. And then um, also, I think it's really important with the adaptive uh, mm -hmm. reuse that the design be reviewed by the members of the DRB. And finally, that a, a business owner be a representative from a small business in the MOR district. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. So, <clears throat> Barbara and Lester Pritchard at 601 West Pennsylvania. Okay. You coming up together? Yeah. All right. Good evening. We wanted to bring another aspect um, to the parking in the MOR district, and that's the human aspect. Um, we wanted to say real simply that we would like the floor that accessible apartments be placed on to be the floor above the parking area. We want this because we want people who live there to be surrounded by other individuals, not cars. And we think that this is the, and in doing that, you'd have to provide access to those apartments as well, whether it be a lift or a ramp or however you get from the submerged or partially submerged parking to that um, level of apartments. Did you want to add anything else? No? And that's all we wanted that's all we wanted to mention unless you have questions. If, um, if you had submerged parking um, and let's say a as some people imagine um, a business on the first floor and residences on the second floor, would you suggest that a requirement that the first floor of residences then must be um, uh, accessible to people with disabilities? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Yes, Ms. Pat. Under the requirements of the Federal Fair Housing Act, do you know if the, if the building had, was if the first floor were completely commercial um, and then it had two floors of apartment buildings above it, would they, would, would the floor above the commercial have to be accessible or would the developer be able to get away without having any accessible units? This is assuming the building has no elevator. The Lord said the, the ground floor needs to be accessible. 
and the good old boy divine that the first four words are in. I died. Okay, so the first floor that has residential has to be accessible. So if the first floor were all, were 100% commercial, then the, the second floor would have to be accessible. But what, what you're concerned about, if I understand correctly, is where the first floor is the parking, they stick in two small apartments to say they satisfy the accessibility requirement, and then the rest of the building is not accessible. Yeah, well, I agree that that's, uh, I'm against that segregation too. Thank you. Questions? <coughs> All right, thanks much. Next is <coughs> Rich Cahill, uh, 307 South Orchard. Rich? <coughs> Hello, back again. Um, I don't know, since this has been going on for so long, one thing that's bothered me is when you look at the, the map of all the little boxes, and I understand why they call things parcels by uh, where the little blocks are, but it might, even, it might be some 90 some by parcels, but 10, of, 10 are controlled by the Presbyterian Church. So everything that's left on the 500 block to the north is a lot and pretty much virtually everything on the north of uh, 600 block will become development. And so when you start subtracting that, and then the Unitarians have three or four parcels, then it's, when you say it's 12 out of 90, well, maybe it's only 12 out of 70 are really owner-occupied. So this, it's not as bleak as you, you may think by just look, counting little boxes. Um, and then I think, I hope everybody on the council at some time in the last two months has at least walked the corridor, I walked Green Street and walked down, and with the idea, what could this stuff be? And I think I haven't brought up since the last time. As you walk by, uh, seven one has been empty since August, and six oh five has been empty since a year ago August, and both have had troubles with uh, break-ins, uh, uh, homeless living in, and we've just been lucky. There's not uh, been a serious. Uh, crime or fire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a couple of things with this ordinance. I think it's a big step in the right direction. I urge it to be passed. I urge some amendments. I think the membership of commission going up to seven is good. I urge that the it should be not just an owner of property, but a resident in the district, and not just an owner adjacent, but a resident. Uh, the resident could be somebody in a co-op, it could be a you know, property owner, but I think you need to get uh, that input because you already have the two commissions. I don't know how that's going to work. Do they draw a straw, see who wants to uh, be part of this? Commission, being on a commission it can be a lot of work, and being on two commissions could be uh, how many commissioners are going to take on that responsibility. And then the other are property owners. So, I think it needs to be a supermajority. I could see it. Uh, it shouldn't be a three. I think something is important. This should be a five to two. Uh, the design review. I think that's going to be its guidelines. You can't put that in. Uh, it's, it's a gray area. It's hard to design for good or bad taste. Uh, I urge council to be patient with the idea of design review criteria. I really am struggling with the whole concept of below grade parking. I think that should just be stricken for the time being and wait to see what happens to me. When I think of below grade parking, I look at the, uh, the large hole in the ground on Gregory in Oregon. I said to Scott Kunkel a few weeks ago, I hope you didn't hit water or a coal seam down there, how deep they went for subground parking. Um, other issues that keep coming up is the demolition. I don't. Th I think that's. Uh, it's sad to see these houses go down, uh, but I don't see you. This is the place to raise the fees for demo. Uh, incentives to restore buildings. I think is a great idea, but I think that is also beyond this uh, particular ordinance. I urge you to pass it tonight, so this commission can be put together and start coming up with design review criteria. 
Okay, thanks. <coughs> Any questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Whalen. Do you think uh, <coughs> do you think you can uh, list of of uh, criteria that we're I've, considering? I was on the. I've seen several lists of criteria. Uh, I'm on the Historic Preservation Commission. We came up with a recommended list. Uh, it's it's nothing new. They're you know established all over the country. Well, that's a matter of opinion, I think. Uh, but I <clears throat> tell me, what do you think uh, asymmetrical design is? Well, I tell you what, what it's not is the the square box with a staircase going up the side. That doesn't say what it is. What, what it is, is is something like the Hunzinger put up next to the old uh, uh, where the, the Quaker church used to be, with porches and roof lines and uh, dormers. It blends in with the streetscape. Also, I would say what was he built across from the Ricker House on the corner of Kohler and Elm fits in the character of a residential house. It's got porches coming out. It's got, you know, it's got a symmetry that would blend in with what, what's rest in the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> would you say that Monticello, Monticello, uh, Jefferson's home would, was asymmetrical? Well, I don't know. This is a quiz, but that's not a, I don't know. I don't think I'd want it. It's a historic building. Yeah, it's a historic building. Attractive? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trained as an architect. I'm sorry. Oh. But, uh, Mount Vernon, what did you think about that as far as as asymmetry? I was, you put a Mount Vernon across the street from me. That's fine. Okay. Well, I'm just curious to know what some of these seem to me to be sort of nebulous. That's why I'm asking you well, this Well, I, I think part of, a, as I envision the design review criteria, also along with it would come up with a booklet would say this is an example of that in this community or a nearby community. It wouldn't be just a, a list. It would also come with, you know, drawings or pictures, supposedly. When you, when you mandate things like this, though, when you absolutely mandate these things, uh, then um, it becomes uh, art aesthetics by legislation, and which is rather difficult to do, don't you think? Of course. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Thanks. I, pr I appreciate. But, it. Yeah, but if you drive up Lincoln Avenue, there's a lot of examples of things that are fairly don't enhance the the gateway into campus. Oh, for sure. It's a it's a commercial. Yeah. So you try and. What you're trying to do is prevent more of that Lincoln Avenue, bad, some of the bad examples from occurring on Green Street. Well, I can understand, I, I think, what the goal is. I appreciate your telling me that, but I'm just wondering how um, mandating some of these things will accomplish that necessarily. Yeah. Well, it's, when they're it's hard to say. It's, it requires a good commission and you know, flexibility. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Pat. Thank you. I, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this um, because I should have asked you in advance, but it, Mr. Whalen's question is what made me think about it. Um, I, you, you mentioned that lots of other communities have design criteria. In the, in the proposal uh, that's uh, going to be made tonight, uh, things like asymmetric design are not mandated. The, the proposal says, uh, compatibility shall be determined by considering how many of the following design criteria are incorporated, and then it lists 21, I think. Is what, are, do you know in other communities, are there other communities where specific design criteria, not necessarily asymmetrical, but you know, things, things like this list are mandated, or is this approach, uh, this more flexible approach of, of saying these are criteria for determining um, compatibility, is, is that more what they do, or is it just different? Do you know? I, I don't know. I should have done more homework. I think it's going to be depending on the town. I, I think if you get to, uh, I don't know, uh, Richmond, Indiana, or Charleston, South Carolina, or a city with extremely uh, aggressive historic districts or areas in town, maybe they're going to be really tight on what they want. When you have something like we have in Urbana, it's trying. You know, it's a little bit tougher with trying to fix something that's, you know, starting to get, can we, can we bring it back? I, my hope it doesn't get any worse. That's what I'm, 
you know, this, the development of 611, you can kind of look, you know, watching it grow. Then go to DRB and see the what uh, Bar brings out in the architecture drawings. Once you see the box going up, and now you see the, you know, it's covered. With, well, you don't know what it's going to be until actually it shows up. And then he's, now you can see the Hunsinger developing. Say so that that blends in. Uh, does New Yorker blend or not? Well, that maybe you flip the coin, but mm -hmm. it, it's very subjective, and that's uh, that's why you have a citizen board to kind of weigh those pros and cons. Okay, thank you, Rich. Appreciate it. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, thanks. Uh, next is Laura Haber on MOR, two hundred six South McCullough. Hi. Um, I'm actually a new homeowner on McCullough, right on Green. And right outside my window, I have a wonderful view of Campus Oaks in all its splendor. And I really hope that whatever you do, you make sure that nothing like Campus Oaks can ever appear along the Green Street Corridor. Again, it's sort of a stark reminder of what can happen when you don't have strict design criteria and you just let the market decide what will go up. Um, there are bright lights shining all the time, and it's really, really ugly. And um, everyone I talk to says, oh, yeah, that was a mistake. We made a mistake with that. And I wonder how that mistake can happen and how you can keep that from happening in the future. So I'd like to see um, very strict criteria, a review board that has teeth that can actually um, veto projects and good representation from people in the neighborhood who are going to be affected by this. Um, I notice a big difference living in this neighborhood versus the neighborhood that I lived in that was more residential in terms of students and transients. There's much less of a sense of community and neighborhood. There's more noise. Um, there's more traffic accidents. There have been three car accidents on my corner in the past month. I mean, it's it's a different kind of experience having the traffic and the apartment buildings and um, hearing parties and having drunk people come to my front steps. Um, I don't want to see that get any worse in that neighborhood. Um, so I hope that, that you'll take into consideration that there's still people living along this corridor that want to have um, nice residential setting at the same time being able to walk to downtown and being able to walk to campus. Um, campus Oaks was supposed to be a condominium, but all the people I know there rent and they're students. So, um, you know, we need to be careful about what we think is going to be um, stable housing and, um, and make sure that it, that it is actually that way. So just wanted to register my opinion. Thanks. Questions? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, next is Steve Ross, 609 West Green. Steve. Good evening. Um, my name is Steve Ross, and I'm at 609, and I've talked to you before, so I'll be brief this time around. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, I uh, agree wholeheartedly with uh, the suggestions that Liz Cardman has presented. Um, that's point number one. Point number two is I think it is wise um, to add design guidelines to the to the current um, text amendment. Uh, it may already have been mentioned this evening, but uh, Dave Barr, uh, developer who is developing uh, 611 West Green right next to me, uh, said more than once during uh, MOR or the development review board process that he would have liked design guidelines. He would have liked to know what people want to see built because that would have saved him some time and effort and expense in um, interacting with the city staff and not really knowing what they wanted. So I agree uh, with Councilman Whelan that it's it's difficult to put in words or perhaps even pictures the ideas of what we think we want, but I think trying to do that is, is a positive step. Um, so I think those, um, the guidelines, um, uh, that uh, I think uh, Councilwoman Pat and Wyman have put together are, are a positive step. I would just bring in your text, uh, your proposed amendment. One pointed out a significant number of, quote, a significant number of design guidelines. Probably we should be 
we're gonna do that. Okay. <laughs> Specific. <laughs> <a little> more <laughs> and uh, just one other. Five are you talked about a front yard setback no greater than the average. I don't know if you necessarily want to say it's, you have to be closer to the street. Uh -huh. My home is pretty far back, and I think it's kind of nice that it's far back. So I would just ask that the City Council uh, um, uh, basically go ahead with what's presented, plus the uh, changes that uh, Liz Cardman has presented and, and uh, Councilwoman Patton Wyman. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Whalen. <coughs> I think that uh, there's a, an attitude here that something like this will help, as you said, uh, to give a guidance to a developer or a designer. And uh, if I were to design something, given a program, uh, architecturally, I would always help to say, uh, have some kind of limitation on this or that. And usually there are some limitations, but um, never never um, well, as, as comprehensive as this, I don't think, because you can limit design to the point where you would never see a, a cathedral of Amiens, of Rennes, of uh, Notre Dame, because they weren't, there was nothing like it before. It was all Romanesque, so you'd have to build something Romanesque. But that's uh, what I'm, well, I would like to know is, what do you think of the the uh, terms? And uh, do you have that, that list in front of you? Yeah, I do. Uh, Q, item Q. Um, <clears throat> to say that um, to, in designs without gables, dormers, or other features along the front facade, or in, in designs without gables, dormers or other features along the front facade to improve the articulation of the structure. What does articulation of the structure mean? Uh, I think it means to break up the, the roof line. Ah, no, but that's a different thing, isn't it? Articulation of the structure could be used, done with painting. It could be painting around windows. It could be uh, having this, the basement sit back and creating a shadow. Shadows articulate. A massive. So, you know, um, the uh, the term. Are, uh, I'm just asking you. Don't you think that's a little nebulous? Um, I guess if my choice is between what's written here and nothing at all, I think what's written here, albeit somewhat ambiguous, is a definite plus. Well, see, that's a problem I'm having. Is uh, and ambiguity ambiguity is not going to solve any of our problems. It's not going to give the guidance that perhaps people need. If, if, if this were to say, and I'm asking you if you would think this would be a little better way of saying it, uh, <clears throat> just drop the articulation of the structure. But to say, uh, in designs without gables, dormers or other features, employ dormers or other features that would uh, break up the, the, uh, pl the plane, the frontal plane of the building or the roof line. Wouldn't that be more to the point? Um, I think this list was originally arrived at from um, the Urbana Planning Commission, so I don't know the exact wording um, off the top of my head or the exact intent. Um, so I'd be a little bit leery of trying to, to fix it when I don't know exactly how it might be broken. Well, <clears throat> if that's the case, then maybe if, if uh, <clears throat> we were to pass something that is not quite uh, definite, maybe we should not vote on that at all. I mean, to say that we should vote on something just because it should be voted on doesn't make any sense to me. It's not, I mean, it's that in itself is nebulous and ambiguous. Yeah, again, think? I, I think it's an improvement. Over nothing. How, however, over nothing. Yeah. And I don't, I think we could wordsmith it all night and we'd still, we'd still have some areas we didn't think about. <clears throat> Well, I'm sure that's possible. In any kind of legislation, that's always possible. But to say uh, specifically to break up the facade or the roof line with, dorm with dormers and uh, other features along the front facade is, is specific, rather than say articulation of the structure. What, wouldn't that make more sense to you? I mean, do you want to just, would you be satisfied with having something, somebody come to you and say, well, we want a, 
The design where the maps are uh, asymmetrical, and defined by shadow lines, uh, punctured by by openings uh, for one purpose or another. In other words, to make something very nebulous. Uh, would that satisfy you if you were designing? Uh, I think it would be a help. I think that was the whole point. That that what was there before with the MOR basically said something like. Um, which I would agree with, but the idea was to be in harmony with the structures that are currently there in terms of, uh, I'm not sure the words, you know, scale, intensity of use, those sorts of things. Yeah, and, and so this is a step in the direction of reducing some of that ambiguity, I think. <coughs> Even though you, as you point out, it, it, it has its own flaws. Well, I'm glad you said that, and I agree. Uh, and I'm not trying to uh, argue these against these points. I think that uh, they, some of them, they, each of them, in some way, lends itself to perhaps design that is not more noteworthy and more appropriate for to match the neighborhood. However, uh, <clears throat> it would seem to me that just to do something other, instead of being more to the point architecturally, would be a step in the right direction, much more than just something that is a little nebulous and a little uh, inarticulate. So, um, if I may ask you a question, then, um, what what are you? What was your? What, what is your ultimate goal? Well, I, I mean, mean what, what would you be most happy with? Give you an example in that one case. Just that just one case. To remind uh, <clears throat> that this is a, a chance for public participation, not debate. We'll have a chance for debate when this comes up in just a couple of minutes. So okay. we can keep this interaction uh, short, please, and then we'll All move right. on yes. with the agenda. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks. I appreciate uh, your input and your thoughts. I. Uh, you're welcome. I'm not trying to argue them against them. Just any other questions for Mr. Ross? Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other petitions and communications from members of the public, from council members? Yeah. Mr. Hayes. <clears throat> yeah, this past week, uh, we celebrated Veterans Day, and uh, I'd like to make a, a comment that many of us forget. It is the veteran, not the preacher, who has given us freedom of religion. It is the veteran, not the reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It is the veteran, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us freedom to assemble. It is the veteran, not the lawyer, who has given us the right to a fair trial. It is the veteran, not the politician, who has given us the right to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other <clears throat> petitions or communications from council members? Okay, with that, uh, we'll go move on to this. Uh, this is an ordinance amending the zoning ordinance of the city of Urbana, Illinois, revisions to various sections of the Urbana zoning ordinance as they pertain to requirements of the MOR, Mixed Office Residential Zoning District, and the procedures of the Development Review Board. This was plan case number 1865-T-03. It was deferred from the uh, council meeting two weeks ago, November 3rd, and so this is open for discussion. Actually, um, staff, uh, do we have a motion on the floor? Yeah, we have a motion on the floor. Um, and <clears throat> so it's open for discussion. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, if you'll turn to page five of your minutes of the last meeting, there were uh, the full text of two motions uh, were in there, and they were um, one was withdrawn and the other was announced. So I I'm, I'm intend to make those again. Uh, the first is I move to amend. Uh, the ordinance section 11-12-F uh, to read, approval of a site plan shall require a two-thirds majority vote and shall be calculated on the basis of those voting members present and not abstaining. However, in no instance shall fewer than four I votes constitute a two-thirds majority. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion, a second. Any discussion? Uh, briefly. 
the, currently, the ordinance uh, requires a unanimous approval by the Development Review Board. Uh, there And there were some concerns with that. So the um, administration's proposal switched it to a simple majority. But I think that the reason for the original requirement of unanimity was because this is an important decision that uh, should not be um, well, that should be decided by the largest number of people possible. I understand the concern that while while a mayor might have had confidence in a staff body not having just one person have having veto power, and that confidence may not um, be the same for a body of, of members of the public. Uh, the best compromise to accomplish the the intent um, and the desires that that led to the uni unanimity requirement in the existing law. Uh, would be to require a two-thirds majority vote, which would still uh, prevent one person from having veto power, but would require that more than just 50% um, plus one to uh, come to agreement on what is appropriate. Any other discussion? Uh, I'd just like, um, <clears throat> I know there are other amendments um, that may be uh, considered as far as the membership uh, is concerned. I don't know, um, Ms. Wyman, are you still planning on making the motion that you were talking about two weeks ago? Yes, I am. Um, well, that uh, this concerns me in that if we have a body of seven right now, and I'm not sure if Ms. Wyman, and maybe she can clarify if it's to change the definition of one of the members of the committee or to add a member. Um, and either way, it substantially changes uh, the meaning of a two-thirds majority when you change the membership. Um, if, a, if a member is added and there are eight members, two-thirds majority means actually three-quarters majority because <clears throat> it's 67 percent, uh, the closest or to get at least 67 percent would be that you'd have to have six out of eight, which is actually a uh, three-quarter majority which is a substantial uh, change. Um, if the, if Ms. Wyman's motion is going to be to change uh, the membership of the owner to a resident, uh, then the, the uh, uh, membership is substantially changed and so that uh, uh, any opposition of two thirds or, or any opposition uh, would only take um, see, what would that be? I guess three nay votes to defeat anything, even over four I votes. So it is a concern, um, and um, it's, it's really hard to determine exactly how much of a concern it is without knowing uh, what the final makeup of the membership is going to be. Um, so I would encourage council members to think twice about this, or maybe uh, um, consider the membership uh, before you consider the the um, what it takes to pass a uh, have a passing vote uh, for approval of the site plan, so this because um, this could be a, a real major change in this in this particular ordinance, Ms. Lyman. Uh, yeah, I want to make a point of clarification on a, a future motion, and then also to speak in support of the motion on the floor. Uh, the, the motion I plan to make is to, and to clarify that it would be um, not my motion that I plan to make would change what is currently currently reads as um, as a member of the MO of the, I'm sorry the development review board to be from a, an owner of property in the MOR mixed office residential zoning district that's labeled as uh, D uh, to a resident in the or of the MOR mixed office residential zoning district that person could also be an owner of property in MOR district but but would not be required to be uh, it's not a radical change it simply allows it simply requires that the person currently reside in the MOR district rather than uh, for example owning a lot of, of land in the MOR district and um, this New York or anywhere else um, and so it, it clarifies that and um, I don't see it as a radical change or anything that should um, take away from the, um, I think, the valuable nature of the 
the motion at hand in that um, is to require the two-thirds. In fact, the changing it from the, the unanimous uh, requirement, which is what it, it has been up to this point, down to uh, a simple majority, I think, would be a much, it would be a much more radical change than simply changing it from a unanimous to a two-thirds majority vote. Uh, so I want to speak in support of the motion uh, on the table and then clarify uh, any any questions that uh, the mayor brought up with regard to um, a future motion. Thank you. Any other discussion? Mr. Whalen? I, I can see the merit of, of um, going to a two-thirds majority rather than full uh, concurrence um, to build in some flexibility to this group. But I wonder if uh, we couldn't say instead of a resident of the MOR, which could be anybody who might be living there for a short time, you may not have a vested interest in the property or in that neighborhood, perhaps we could say the owner or his or her agent. And I would... Sorry. I would say that uh, the, the two-thirds majority uh, is certainly seems to me to be more flexible than the, the um, unanimous, major, uh, unanimous uh, consent. But I would think that um, to say to, to somebody, who, uh, that is to say a resident who has no vested interest or uh, property rights in that neighborhood uh, or in the building who might just be here for a semester, uh, to include them would be, uh, could possibly happen and be uh, a mistake when you could say an owner or his or her agent. And uh, I don't know if I don't want to, uh, I'd like to hear your, your point of view of that, but I would like to make a motion to that effect to. A motion on the floor. I know, to amend it. Though. A yeah. motion is on the floor right now about uh, Ms. Ms. Weinman hasn't brought her motion up. She intends to bring that up at, yes. in okay. a few minutes, I suppose. I'd like to hear. Any other discussion? This is a motion to change the voting requirement from a majority to two-thirds. No further discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Any further discussion? Ms. Weinman. Uh, so I've got two motions. The first one is the one that was that I uh, mentioned in the at the last city council meeting, and that is discussed in the minutes. Um, that is, and, and that I just mentioned, that is on page six of the ordinance amending the zoning ordinance of the city of Urbana that was in our um, council pack two weeks ago, um, where we got to talk about membership C, membership one. Um, about the Development Review Board shall consist of seven members, changing D again, which currently reads an owner of property in the MOR, Mixed Office Residential Zoning District, to and a resident of the MOR, Mixed Office Residential Zoning District, so moved. Second. We have a motion, a second. Is there any discussion? Wyman. Uh, speaking to the motion, uh, just clarifying or, or stating more clearly, hopefully, uh, what I uh, tried to clarify with the mayor's question uh, and answering uh, Mr. Whalen's question uh, regarding um, the requirement. The, the change is, again, to make it so that the person is a resident of the MOR, Mixed Office Residential Zoning District, and not just someone who owns property, but perhaps doesn't doesn't give a flying care um, about what, what happens to the MOR district. Um, that that person, that uh, resident, uh, under my proposal, could be a renter, uh, someone who owns a co-op, someone who owns the um, the house, the building, um, and lives there. As long as they live there, uh, it doesn't matter what their status is, whether they own property, whether um, or w what their wealth status is, or anything like that. It simply is dependent on the fact that they are a resident. And then, of course, the other requirement on getting um, becoming a member of the Development Review Board is that you would have to be nominated by the mayor and approved by a majority of the City Council. Um, there are, Mr. Whalen, I think, alluded to a concern that. Um, under my proposal, a resident could be someone who was only here for a few months, um, or a dreaded student, or one of those other statuses that, that um, 
some people don't think should have um, the status of being on boards or city councils or that sort of thing. Um, the requirement, I see it as something that gets rid of the status of being a homeowner, which is something that um, I think is not a not something that speaks to one's ability to um, to whether or not they're going to be a good representative on the development review board and whether they're going to adequately represent the concerns and needs of the residents of that MOR district. Um, I have confidence that this mayor and future mayors um, decades from now will appoint residents and will screen residents and question them and ask them about their concern of the MOR district and why they're applying to be on the board and um, and that council members will not shirk their duty uh, when evaluating the proposal by the mayor of uh, a resident of the MOR district or other proposed members of the um, development review board in, in making sure that they have the adequate uh, and important interests of the MOR district in mind. Thank you. Mr. Whalen. <coughs> I didn't uh, mean to imply that a grad student wouldn't have a valid interest or, or substantially good interest. So I didn't say that. And uh, But I, did, I do think that property rights are very important, and it's something that we tend to forget. Uh, and, and it's something that a lot of people in Urbana are very concerned about. And in this particular case, uh, in this area, I think somebody who is an owner doesn't necessarily mean that person is wealthy it, and and therefore you know uh, if, if, <coughs> I hope the implication isn't there that wealthy person isn't have an interest a valid interest either but uh, sometimes we think of that we think that wealthy people are uh, just not not interested in the nature of the of the of the area that their property is in. But I think a, a property owner, of somebody with property rights, might be much more interested in what is happening there than uh, somebody who's only there for a short time. And, and a lot of people who are tenants don't think of themselves as uh, having property rights, although in their rent they do, and they are uh, valid you know, citizens in that right. But I think that... Um, it should include an owner uh, of, of uh, or, as I said, his or her agent. Further discussion, Ms. Bat. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I, on the whole subject of whether or not someone should have to be a property owner just on, on, on a committee or have some other position of responsibility, I, I'd like to remind anyone who's listening that five of the seven council members sitting here right now were renters when they were first elected to the city council, um, even though many of us are now owners. Um, and that, um, <clears throat> that is just one example of how in a community uh, where some of the households are renter, people, um, some people who are interested in civic <clears throat> matters are in fact renters. I know I rented the same place on the corner of Busey in Illinois for 20 years and watched many a homeowner come and go during the time that I was renting there. And, and because of my involvement in the neighborhood, I was, um, uh, I was especially interested in what was going on here at, at the city and, and attended many, many meetings for years and years before I finally uh, was, uh, um, became a city <laughs> council member. <clears throat> but, excuse me, <clears throat> at any rate, the, the main point that Ms. Wyman pointed out, which, which speaks to all this, is the mayor chooses the people. It's not like there's a lottery and like, oops, if, it's, if it just says it's a resident, you're going to end up with some tenant who's leaving town in three months. Um, presumably, any mayor would, would appoint um, responsible people who are genuinely interested. Uh, and the primary purpose of this body is to make responsible decisions for um, that, um, to promote the public welfare. Um, if an individual actually has a specific property right interest in a particular case that that individual would be expected to recuse themselves um, and abstain because of a, of a I also want to point out where this comes from the original proposal that the staff made to the plan commission was for a five member body and that was a member of the plan commission a member of the historic preservation commission and both of those members will be chosen by the mayor not by those commissions um, a licensed architect uh, and a, a citizen residing inside or within two, or a citizen residing within 250 feet of the MOR district and then it said an owner of property in the MOR and the idea was that that owner could be a homeowner or a developer 
But then when the plan commission expected people on it, uh, staff came back with another proposal to expand it to seven, and when they expanded to seven, they added a developer as well as an owner of a local business. So that um, weighed against the need to leave open the possibility that the property owner in the MOR district would be a developer. And that's really the essence of Ms. Wyman's motion is um, we've already got in this composition a developer and a, another business owner who is something other than a developer and someone who lives within the MOR district or I mean someone who lives um, you know, within 250 feet of it and a licensed architect and two other commissioners. So the person actually from the MOR district should be someone who lives there. Uh, and that's really all this is saying is that be a, a, a resident of the MOR district, I think it's a good motion and I support it. I'm, yes, Mr. Otto. I'm a little bit confused. So the if Mrs. Wyman's amendment passed, we'd have basically two slots for residents of the MOR district. Is that is that correct? Actually, Two of the seven. That, yeah. this is within uh, That's my understanding. It would re one would read a uh, a red in the MOR, and another one would be a citizen residing inside or within 200 feet or 250 feet of the MOR. So one in the MOR and one in the greater MOR area. <laughs> Ms. Mr. Otto. Yeah. Well, I would just, um, I mean, if you're talking about drawing from a universe of 12 people who who actually live in the MOR district, and I don't know how many people live within 250 feet, you're, uh, it's not always easy to find members of boards and commissions. So if you're saying you're going to have two, we may end up with a seat that's vacant for a substantial amount of the time uh, simply because um, of a lack of people who both fit the requirements of the <coughs> ordinance and uh, are interested in, um, on the commission. I, I mean, what, what I like clarify? about the... I, it, it, I think, Ms. Wyman, I think so, yeah. I, you would be, you're thinking of owner residents that are in the MOR, and that's right. a very small group. And what Ms. Wyman is suggesting is any resident of the MOR Okay. So that would be, I don't know, how many thousand people or so. Okay. And uh, then the other, of course, is a larger area, the, the MOR plus, you know, anything within 250 feet, any resident, okay. not just owner residents. Well, I'll go ahead and make my larger point, which was that I think, you know, what you're trying to do in putting together a group like this is to have it be a public body where anybody who's interested in it can come and and address its deliberations, number one. And then number two, to have um, it be representative so that as the public body itself uh, deliberates, all have an interest in that area uh, can be heard. So I, I guess I don't really see what's the point of having an extra voice uh, for a resident since that voice is already made. I mean. If we were to say, well, we're going to have two votes for developers or two votes for small business owners or two votes for architects, um, it would seem to me that that would be uh, inappropriate. It might be better to just go ahead and, and keep with the balance where we have one of each of these categories. Further discussion? <coughs> Mr. Whalen? <coughs> We've heard a great deal from our chancellor of the university about diversity and uh, <clears throat> I think that in this case um, we want when we want we talk about diversity what we do want is a number of people with particular particularly different interests in in uh, the neighborhood and in, in the MOR and um, I, that's why I think that a, an owner of property a resident is certainly not the, the, you know I, I don't uh, mean to um, disparage that or uh, denigrate the interests of the resident by any means. I've been a tenant all my life until not too many years ago when I could afford my own home. And, uh, and so I can appreciate that participation. But at the same time, I do think that somebody who owns the property has a different uh, perspective 
and it should be included for the health of that, that group, that body. Further discussion? <clears throat> Ms. Wyman. Uh, I'd just like to point out a couple things. One is that um, as, the, um, as the, the membership is outlined um, from the staff memo, there's a potential to have three business owners or, or yeah, business representatives on the board. Um, I also want to compare this a little bit to the plan commission, where on the plan commission there is, I believe, up to one member who can be outside of the district that the plan commission is in charge of, that is the city of Urbana. One person can be from the extraterritorial jurisdictional area. Um, under this proposal, or current, um, the staff's proposal, uh, as we received it two weeks ago, a member of the Urbana Plan Commission doesn't have to live in the MOR district. A member of the Urbana Historic Preservation Commission, that's letter B, doesn't have to live in the MOR district. A licensed architect does not have to live in the MOR district. An owner of property in the MOR Mixed Office Residential District, that's letter D, does not have to live in the MOR district. A citizen residing inside or within 250 feet of the MOR Mixed Office Residential Zoning District may, in fact, live in the MOR district. A local developer, again, does not have to live within the MOR district. And an owner of a local business, small local business, uh, does not have to live in the MOR district. So what, you're, what we could potentially see is one out of seven members living in the district that is being contemplated that, that, um, for which buildings and proposals are being discussed. This idea then uh, under my proposal is simply to add another resident um, to, to make it uh, so that it would be at minimum one, but perhaps two and maybe more. Uh, of residents who would be deciding issues and contemplating issues affecting, directly affecting the neighborhood, the mixed office residential district in which they live. Um, again, as in, Mr. Whalen had suggested, and certainly I got an email uh, from someone else suggesting that it be a resident who is an owner of property, or a resi an owner of property in the MOR district who is a resident as well in the MOR district. Um, it's, uh, I think, a status issue. I think that, you know, as I think uh, Ms. Pat pointed out, um, while five of the seven of us uh, on the city council now were uh, renters when we uh, ran for council and apparently um, were accepted by our constituents as um, having enough interest in city matters to be elected, um, Mr. Otto and I continue to rent our properties. And um, I don't think that the status of being a renter or being a homeowner uh, I guess I don't give that as much weight as Mr. Whalen does um, to one's uh, contributions to the MOR district. We, we see it differently, um, but that's, that's where I come in. Thank you. For discussion? Well, <clears throat> uh, you know, while you you're say it's true, I mean, the fact that people who are interested in uh, politics of the city uh, can not, not, do not necessarily have to own a home. And that's uh, it's a different kind of thing. We're talking here about the uh, control over development of property. And consequently, uh, ownership of property becomes more significant than it does in, in an um, election. For example, when this country was formed, you had to own property to pay to be able to vote. And that has been changed, uh, fortunately, so that we have a greater participation in our democracy. But in the case of uh, dealing specifically with control over people's property and uh, how it affects their pocketbook and their ownership rights is uh, something that is also considered in this particular realm of great value, and I would say that uh, to uh, not include it. Further discussion? I guess the, the concern that I have is that, you know, when, when you know, we've been talking about reconstituting the Development Review, Review Board for a number of years, and what we would hope to get in the MOR district is an unbiased and balanced view of what uh, good architectural criteria are. 
And my concern with loading it up with uh, people that have a vested interest is that you get further and further away from getting that true unbiased view. And so I can I know that because I've already been lobbied by owners of property in the district that if we have the more residents that we have on the DRB, the more uh, owners of property that we're going to have in the DRB. And these are people who's, who have a real vested interest in the area and are going to be not so much concerned about having an unbiased view of uh, what is good for the district, but they have very real interests uh, and uh, which may not lead to the best decision making. So if we have, <coughs> so, the, so the more residents of the MOR that we have, then I'm going to get pressure to put more people, uh, uh, owners of property, and then you get clashes, uh, which uh, I don't think is going to be a healthy dynamic for the Development Review Board. Um, so I, I can see that, um, you know, um, that they're, you know, why Ms. Wyman is, is making this, I just have, you know, as I say, my vision, thinking about this for years, is to try to get a body that sits more above the fray and makes uh, a decision based on the, the actual uh, merits of the case rather than getting people that have entrenched long-term views, and I see this as being uh, as a step in that direction. So I have some concerns with it. Um, although it may not be unworkable, I, I do have some concerns with it. Uh, I'm not sure if you were speaking in support or in opposition of my motion. I'm actually, I'm, support, I'm speaking in opposition uh, to it, um, uh, but, you know, I think it, the you know, your point that the mayor makes these appointments um, is one that uh, I consider, uh, you know, <laughs> very per or, like, since I'd be the one that would be making these. But it makes my job that much harder when uh, you've got that many involved people uh, in uh, that have a, a very direct interest in the area, and it's. It seems to me that we have the best decision making when people are able to take a, a step back and uh, not have such view, uh, and, but still make a very uh, thoughtful and intelligent decision based on the criteria uh, that we give them. And so I'm concerned that, as I said, the more people that we have um, with a direct interest, then um, the more uh, uh, the, the less of an unbiased view we're going to get on these particular decisions. And so maybe um, an improvement would, uh, if if the council is going to go with uh, another uh, resident position, would be to have just simply a resident position and not uh, limit it to um, uh, 200, uh, or not limit it to the MOR, but have it uh, citywide so that uh, that person uh, could take a, a larger view of the issues that can be. No, that's all right. Sorry. Any other discussion, Ms. Chenoweth? I, um, I think of neighborhoods as extremely subjective things and that, the, that people in neighborhoods have different cultures and those cultures determine what is liked and not liked in the area. I would say in response to the mayor's comments that um, when people don't participate in the decisions that affect their lives, they feel shut out and they also can take a status of victim of being on the outside not having a place at the table when people have a place at the table then they have a venue in which to express their their feelings about something um, their subjective opinions and interests and so I um, I actually think that this motion Ms. Wyman's motion is really a, a recipe building consensus because um, the concept of you know any kind of democratic body is that you get a bunch of people who have really different conflicting interests to work on something together and there isn't some interest that's left out of the picture that then has months and months and months on end to make statements over and over again about an interest which up until now has not been represented formally in the development review board and that interest is the the neighbors uh, my constituent Ms. Pat's constituents, Ms. Wyman's constituents, Ms. Who's constituents, those are the people who have been formally shut out of this process 
vis-a-vis the Development Review Board. Certainly they've had the ability to come before council and speak, and they have, and they've shown uh, what I consider to be an incredible um, uh, kind of involvement, and, and I'm, I'm really uh, proud to live in a neighborhood where people are as involved in the neighborhood, what the neighborhood looks like, what the future of the neighborhood is. I couldn't, I couldn't ask for um, uh, such, you know, such in, an involved polity involved in, in, in what their neighborhood is going to look like in the visioning process. So I, I think, um, you know, it's absolutely healthy that we've seen interest from our neighborhood and from the MOR involved. I also think that we need to look at longer term visions for the city in terms of economic development. And I think that, that Ms. Wyman's uh, uh, motion really allows for a, um, a body on a development review board that really brings everyone to the table and gives everybody a place, various interests that, that have been involved in this conversation. For discussion? Mr. Whalen? <clears throat> you know, uh, bias comes in many different stripes, and uh, we have <clears throat> uh, biases for uh, a lot of reasons, and, uh, and they're legitimate biases. Some biases, I mean, but generally, unless they're harmful to other people, are legitimate. They're subjective, subjective uh, preferences rather than uh, prejudices, preferences, meaning they prefer to have something happen in their neighborhood. And I think speaking to what Ms. Chenoweth just said, that uh, that would be uh, supplied by this board. But to exclude uh, somebody who owns property in that area is uh, sends a signal out in the city to homeowners, and property owners that their interests are being possibly ignored. I'll give you an example. I was talking to uh, a realtor, a real estate developer, manager of property the other day, and I was out walking and catch rays, which I needed very badly. And the, uh, this fellow was telling me that he sold all this property in Urbana for a couple of reasons. One, and uh, Ms. Wyman and Ms. Uh, Pat are very familiar with this, the ordinance that we passed that does not, uh, that does not allow a landlord to exclude a Section 8 of voucher system, which was even HUD doesn't employ. Uh, the one other ordinance and, and uh, <clears throat> that says that a person who has recently been released from prison for a violent crime, rape, or murder cannot be refused uh, tenancy. And uh, of course, landlords we know can possibly find other ways to do, deal with that. But the idea is that that people are perceiving is that the property rights are being um, diminished in, in the city. Whether that's true or not, and I, uh, I think there are many good reasons why we do the thing. I think that in order to strike a balance here that would provide for that diversity that Ms. Chenoweth speaks of, uh, with the um, real interests that are not only diverse but, but uh, real in, in this area, I think would include a, somebody who lives in the area who owns the property and uh, I can I'm concerned about that the, you know the, the image we're giving people in the city of Urbana discussion no further discussion all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. Can Opposed? We get a roll oh, yeah um, Ms. Clark would you call the roll Ms. Shenoweth yes Mr. Hayes? Yes. Mr. Otto? No. Ms. Pat? Wyman? No. Ms. Wyman? Yes. That motion carries. Um, floor is open for discussion on the main motion. Ms. Chenoweth? I would like to make an amendment to the main motion. Uh, and my amendment is actually listed on page five of the minutes of the previous meeting to which this was discussed two weeks ago. At the bottom of page five, um, 
I'm proposing that on page, if in the ordinance, it's actually page 6C, uh, the section called membership, 1G. So, but you can find the language of it on page 5 of the minutes. <laughs> it's a little confusing, but when council members are there, uh, it's probably easier to look at the minutes. Um, it, the, uh, I propose that that section, 6C membership 1G be changed to read an owner of a local small business with fewer than 40 employees. Second. We have a motion or a second. Any discussion? Yes, I'm, I, um, I supported the staff's uh, move to put a business owner on the uh, development review board, and this is why I, um, I continue to maintain, and I know that this is somewhat contentious, and I've had good conversations uh, with people on this issue, that um, the MOR is really uh, ripe for um, low intensity uh, business uses, particularly near the downtown, but really throughout. Um, and it, even though those who have complained about or, or have raised concerns about um, businesses locating in the MOR, when I actually list the businesses that are there currently, they say, oh, well, you know, we really like the fact that, that we have um, you know, body works and hair cutting and um, social workers and, and uh, some law offices, et cetera, in that area. Um, and that hasn't been a problem. And, uh, and actually, as a business owner, I can speak that um, as someone who has, both for businesses and nonprofits I'm involved in, looked for spaces in downtown, um, it will may come become come as surprising to some people that uh, downtown Urbana has a vacancy rate that is um, alarmingly uh, small. It's very difficult to find space in downtown. Now, yes, we can talk about Lincoln Square, and that's really the only place that there is some vacancy, and that's a very particular kind of space. There is not a lot of infrastructure for office spaces in downtown Urbana. And the price of office space in downtown Urbana is um, significantly higher than in Champaign the last I checked, which was about a year uh, and, and a half ago. So um, we have a situation where uh, businesses are looking for office spaces. They're daytime businesses. They have two to three people visiting them at once. Um, it could be accommodated on site. There, the um, the uh, the folks coming and visiting those businesses could be accommodated on site. And I'm uh, very much supportive of the MOR looking like, say, parts of uh, Willie Street for those of those of uh, the audience uh, and council who know uh, Madison. Uh, and there are many other examples. There's a really nice mixed use um, small business, um, low intensity. Uh, multifamily, uh, you know, in terms of s some limits on multifamily dwellings and some single family. And it really is, is a nice mix. So I would like to see that business interest um, on this development review board. The piece I'm concerned about is that um, someone who works for a business that employs 500 uh, employees could be considered under the language that staff proposed. So I'm now proposing that it really be a small business since that's really who, that's the constituency we are thinking of in terms of understanding what it takes for a small business to locate in a particular uh, mixed use corridor. And um, and so I, I uh, offer uh, the fewer than 40 employees. I did do some research on this and um, uh, it, it was between 50 and 100 employees is usually what's considered a small business in large, um, in, in significantly uh, large cities, uh, you know, 150 to 200,000 and, and up. So I thought that 40 would probably be appropriate scale for um, the city of Urbana. Um, I will say, I'll tag on to this since, since I have the floor, that I am hoping um, and will be uh, pressing for uh, the staff and the administration to promote the MOR as a place for um, low intensity businesses, um, potentially small retail and definitely office spaces to um, the uh, areas in town that are looking, the Small Business Development Center, the Economic Development Corporation Association and all those organ and the city, all of whom are helping to locate businesses in our community. Any other discussion? Other discussion. All those in favor, please sing the public saying aye. Please. Um, Ms. Clark. Ms. Shinoweth. Yes. Mr. Hayes. Yes. Ms. Huth. Yes. Mr. Otto. Yes. 
Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Wyman? Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> Is there further discussion on the main motion? Okay. Wyman? Yes, I'd like to pass out, um, uh, well, I'm, going, I'm passing out a, um, a, sm a small change to what was included in all, all council members' packets. You could call the letter, everyone's packet. Um, on the reverse side, starts adding to page 11 of last week's packet. So if everyone understands that, I put extra copies on the back table. Um, so if members of the public are interested, um, there are just a few changes. One, the first change is um, one that was recommended by legal. And so we, we put that in replacing what was number five, uh, which said include a significant number of the following design criteria to instead instead state in addition compatibility shall be determined by considering how many of the following design criteria incorporated <coughs> a couple other small word changes um, that I've highlighted so this highlighted parts are those that are different from what was in the packet and uh, so with this I'd like to move passed out um, that motion second we have a motion a second um, as well. uh, just speaking a little bit to it I know I, I actually I'm not sure if I spoke to it two weeks ago um, before uh, when this was originally on the floor, I think this as um, after uh, council decided to wait two weeks to vote on this, um, I followed up with staff to ask if there was a reason why we couldn't um, go ahead and, and suggest some design <coughs> guideline review. Um, as you'll recall on page 11 of the um, ordinance that was in our packet two weeks ago, uh, it called for design guideline review um, criteria to be reserved. And uh, staff had suggested that um, we'll be seeing that in January of 2004 or something like that, that th those would be um, adopted by council. The desire in, um, that Ms. Pat ha and I had in bringing this forward tonight um, before the moratorium for the MOR district uh, expires is to give the development review thing to be able to point to as they're starting to develop, uh, if they have to consider any proposals for um, new construction or significant um, alterations in the MOR district in the interim until the Development Review Board, Plan Commission, and Council have a time, have a chance to review and, and really delve more into this. Um, the the materials are taken, I think, as as my as our letter states from the staff packet, um, suggested key elements that was in our packet. Um, and so perhaps if they look from these things look familiar, these suggestions look familiar. That's probably why. Um, if you'll notice the top four st um, are stating that new structures shall include these. Those are main entrance on the street side of the building. If the lot has more than one street, then on the more f major frontage, the second requirement that the new any new structure should have windows facing each street frontage. Third, it should have a pitched roof. And that is so it wouldn't be just a box. Um, the fourth is that it have architecturally screened parking if parking is beneath the building so that cars are not visible from the front side or backyards. Change then in the staff um, from legal is that uh, instead of the significant number, it just says a compatibility, in addition compatibility, shall be determined by considering how many of the following design criteria in, are incorporated. So this list then, um, following that statement, are, are not part of the mandatory list, but Again, compatibility shall be determined by how many of these, um, and that's something the Development Review Board can consider. Um, it doesn't mean that if it if the pro so what it means is if the proposed criteria proposed new structure has some of these, all of these, um, or has the opposite of some of them, uh, it doesn't mean that it can't be proposed. But these are guidelines, and again, this is meant uh, not as something that will stay in concrete forever, but uh, something to be looked at and um, followed until until such time as we get from the Development Review Board or other bodies, uh, other criteria <laughs> to um, uh, to consider uh, passing for the Deve Development Review Board to consider in their review of uh, designs of new and proposed structural we'll follow-up on that is um, what I think Steve Ross said uh, and has said before is that when Bar was coming to Bar Real Estate was coming to Development Review Board, saying you know, making their proposals, they said we wish we had some design review criteria. Here's a list, um, and so I'm uh, proposing those, uh, and uh, hope to have your support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Point of parliamentary inquiry: 
We're presented with a, an amendment that creates a whole new section in the zoning ordinance that isn't there yet. Um, and I'm wondering, is this actually proper for us to consider this without uh, zoning commission or planning commission uh, input on major amendments to the uh, zoning ordinance such as, the, such as this? Aren't they required to uh, at least hear on it and pass on it, whether yay or nay? Well, that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Holtz, you know our code uh, well enough to know if this meets those, the definition that it has to go to plan commission first. Well, Mayor, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer. <laughs> I should have thought of this earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe while you discuss it, I can go up and have a look and see in the context of the specific question, see if there's uh, something that we can uh, that we can hang our hats on. Maybe Ms. Pat has something to say about it. Pat? Well, in answer to questions, similar questions at, at the last meeting, this, or maybe I should just let Mr. Quasi answer, but my understanding is that the initial public notice for the plan case um, was uh, was to, I, I don't know the language in front of me, but was to review all of these different aspects of the um, of the MOR district. I mean, it spelled out specific things and that this and that design was one of them. Is that correct? That's true. Um, and we did the same when we did the amendments to the Historic Preservation Ordinance because it was impossible in the legal ad to describe exactly every change that's going to be proposed. So the, the notice was somewhat general. I don't know if that exactly addresses. I, I uh, guess Mr. the Rose reason that I, I I bring this up is that, you know, um, this may be a good set of design criteria. It may not be. I don't really know enough about design guidelines uh, to be able to figure that out uh, in sort of the three days since this was was put in our packet. And I know that at least at one time it was envisioned that the Planning Commission was going to review and come up with a set of design guidelines. And um, even in the public input tonight, we haven't heard very much that is uh, specific to it. Mr. Whalen had an exchange that was fairly specific on some of the yeas and nays, but I think we would make uh, a much better uh, decision and a more informed decision if we had the benefit of the planning process uh, as part of this. Ms. Chenoweth? Um, I want to respond to that to the concern behind your question, uh, Mr. Otto, simply because I have a, a similar concern. And I did speak to Ms. Wyman about this concern earlier, and we um, my understanding of our this, we have a moratorium on development. Um, we need to um, end that moratorium in a reasonable time frame to allow for development in, of, of people who own property in the MOR. Um, that moratorium, I believe, is up at the end of this month. Um, and we, we were, um, we expected to have, I think council members expected to have some design guidelines that we were going to be looking at when we uh, addressed these amendments to the MOR zoning. And um, uh, it, there's a lot of work involved in doing that. And understandably, um, in many ways, we, we don't have the design guidelines that we expected. And yet, we've hit kind of the end of the moratorium. So um, it, it's my understanding that Civitas, the, the um, group that has located downtown, it involves a number of um, students of design at the university is helping us develop that. In the interim, I have um, a concern that we, that we don't, that development will go through and there won't really be any design guidelines. There'll just be kind of um, a general sense in a staff memo of some things that we should be considering in the future. A developer may um, uh, want to develop a property in the area between now and when we see those design guidelines. And um, and when the Development Review Board says, well, you know, you meet zero of the design criteria on this list in this staff memo, the developer says, well, that's just a staff memo. That's not really policy, and you don't really have a right to stand in my way. And so there's some, you know, potentially legal issues in kind of letting it stay open. I still anticipate that um, 
uh, I'm speaking in support of this, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, Ms. Wyman's motion, because I feel like in many ways it's a stopgap measure, and I anticipate that when Civitas is done with their work, that we may be seeing some fine-tuning and tweaking of these design criteria. Um, I expect that. I, I support it. I don't have a problem with coming back to the table and looking at the design criteria and hearing arguments for why a particular criteria shouldn't exist or, or why we should add something. So I consider this to be um, an intelligent stopgap measure given the circumstances that we're in until we um, kind of have another round of fine-tuning design criteria or some of the work that Civitas is doing is done. So I, I guess I would, I understand your concern in that. Um, I, I, I think not the legal concern, but the concern that this is quite a bit here and we haven't really had a full conversation about every piece of it. Um, and that uh, I do believe that we are going to have an opportunity uh, to, to address those things in, again in the future and kind of fine tune it. So maybe it's a rough draft. Brad? Thank you. Just to tell you uh, how this came about, after the meeting two weeks ago, uh, Ms. Wyman and I were talking about how members of the public seemed to think that this was part of the plan case, these design criteria. And that is because council members and city staff spoke as though they were. Um, these, everything, on, every single thing on this list, with the exception of, of uh, number four regarding the screening of the parking, every one of these things on the list was in writing, in which you received not three days ago, but two weeks and three days ago. Uh, and was presented in the initial presentation about this case by um, by our city staff uh, as um, as the list that they compiled from the discussions at the plan commission at the historic preservation commission. All this was discussed. Well, Ruthie and I didn't dream this up out of our own heads or anything. We pulled it, or actually she pulled it right out of the packet. Um, and the one thing that wasn't right out of the packet number four was what was discussed um, and. Uh, and again, the people who wanted to allow parking under a building, which I do not, and, and the people who, who spoke against and voted against my motion to remove that, all talked about it as though it would be screened and you wouldn't see it. So basically, um, what this is about is putting in writing what we're telling the public we're doing. It's just about being honest with people. I don't think we should tell people, oh, this is all part of it, but then we won't really put it in writing. If this is really part of it, it should be in writing. Uh, I would be glad to see something um, m uh, fleshed out more with regard to the design criteria, but as I know Mr. Whalen was speaking against this, but actually in speaking against it, he made the best argument for it, saying that ambiguity isn't a good thing. Well, th if we pass the plan case as was presented to us without any design criteria, that's about as we could get. We're, we're going to let the staff off the hook for making decisions about whether or not a building is compatible, appoint a citizen task force and tell them it's your job, but we're not going to tell you how to do it. I don't see the point in doing that. Uh, in July, the city council passed um, an ordinance creating a moratorium, putting a deadline, which I believe is the end of this week, not this month. Uh, and um, and and the purpose of the, the purpose of the moratorium <laughs> was to develop design guidelines. I just don't feel it's it's right or honest to not include something uh, in this uh, ordinance that we're going that I believe we're going to approve tonight. Um, uh, we just have to include something in it. I think, and this and this is Mr. what the staff gave us, <coughs> Mr. Otto. <coughs> well, I, I guess I would just point out that the previous development review board. Uh, wasn't working with an explicit uh, set of guidelines, and so I don't think it would mean that this development review board uh, couldn't function. You would still have all the interests represented at the table, and they would still be uh, talking. I mean, the other thing that in line is uh, the mayor has to find people who are willing to serve and to propose them to council and for them to be approved, and we're looking at design line, design guidelines. Uh, coming back to council in January, so uh, those may well be in place by the time the development review board meets uh, for the first time. Um, and so I guess that's why I feel that 
you know, we shouldn't be hasty and we should get uh, input from uh, those bodies that uh, we've asked to, to provide us with input on this, namely the, the Planning Commission. Uh, Mr. Holtz, did you uh, find anything? Yeah, I, I just had a, I pulled my copy of the zoning ordinance and had a look at, uh, at the requirements for uh, making amendments. And um, uh, the process basically is for this to come uh, through plan commission uh, or an other appropriate body. And, uh, you know, any time that you uh, have a notice requirement of any kind of legislation or any kind of uh, proposal that's out there, uh, you'll have certain concerns about how, how uh, precise something needs to be and how much ambiguity you can stand to have in it in order to give the proper kind of a notice uh, yet without uh, your ability to do what you need to do. And it seems to me that, um, that Ms. Pat's point is well taken that um, this was part of the notices that went out in the first place that design uh, criteria were part of what was discussed all along. That was, um, by my own recollection, uh, part of what the MOR specifically mentioned. Um, uh, pardon me, not the the moratorium specifically mentioned, and uh, I, I think we're we're clearly within the range of of uh, the notices that went out initiating this process in the first place. Now, obviously, that's a different question than than uh, Mr. Otto's uh, latest point, which is that, or even if we even if uh, uh, we've had proper notice, is this something <coughs> that we should, as a matter of uh, as a matter of uh, of uh, uh, um, good sense. Um, uh, Hold off on, and obviously, uh, you know how people decide on that is up to themselves. Seems to me it makes sense to to um, put these in. Um, I'm not <clears throat> real. Obviously, this is a draft and needs some spit and polish. Um, but I think that some design guidelines should be included. Um, you know. It, I realize our the ordinance uh, has a section called design guidelines and even without these specific guidelines it says the development review board shall consider the architectural appearance massing color building materials or architectural details of the structure <coughs> which is exactly <coughs> opposite of the current uh, wording which says that they will not <laughs> consider architectural appearance um, so that's a big step in the right direction just there but I think that the more specifics that we can give uh, to the, the DRB, the better. Um, and these are our criteria that have, you know, well, they haven't been discussed fully. They've had, uh, you know, some uh, level of discussion and uh, consensus that, um, I mean, I think it's a good starting point knowing that, you know, the first thing we're going to be doing is, is uh, coming up with a more comprehensive process that will go through uh, the plan commission among other uh, bodies for review. So I don't think there's any problem in uh, procedurally. Um, you know, I, I do think that, you know, this is a little redder than nothing. Uh, Ms. Wyman. Yes, thank you. Um, just to address a couple of the other issues that have come up. Um, as far as not having much of a hearing or that sort of thing, just to reemphasize one of the things that Ms. Pat said, which is that these issues are things are, are issues, these design guidelines are issues that have been discussed um, by plan commission, by historic uh, plan commission uh, in the staff memo that we've had for more than two weeks by um, members of the public who came to speak to us two weeks ago, by members of council that spoke on this two weeks ago, and um, and then in, in follow-ups. Uh, I called every single council member last night, yesterday evening, to discuss this issue. I appreciate um, uh, some of these changes. Um, it's, Ms. Huth had suggested some of which are included in here. Uh, Mr. Ross, when he came, pointed out the, the um, typo that, I had, that we had in letter R. Um, just a couple of those changes. We've had feedback again from, um, I've had a lot of comments today on my email um, from people who received copies of this and wanted to give their feedback and ask questions. Um, and those issues, uh, if people don't feel that they're resolved tonight, certainly will be forwarded on to the Development Review Board. I do hope we have a Development Review Board in place before the first uh, proposal in the MOR district uh, is, is made. I'm not sure that that's going to happen, um, not because people aren't getting on the stick, but because we've got um, holidays coming. We've got <coughs> probably two council meetings or a committee meeting and a council meeting that will be canceled um, due to the holidays. We've got um, 
just the fact that it's going to take time to find people um, and for the mayor to be able to interview people and um, that sort of thing uh, for people who would qualify for um, the development review board and if we see them in January that will be wonderful but if we don't um, or if we don't um, if they don't have t if they've got a if the development review, review board has to look at the proposals and doesn't have the time to do a seven hour marathon meeting to also discuss and make final decisions on desired guidelines um, then at least this is in place and this is something that they can turn to um, and again this is these are issues that have been discussed in council memos in plan commission in historic preservation commission and out in the general public um, public to the council tonight and um, and uh, again, last night when I was, um, or before council, when I was able to speak with um, Ms. Huth, Ms. Chenoweth, Mr. Hayes, Ms. Pat, um, and get the feedback from staff on legal changes as well. Thank you. Any other discussion? Ms. Huth? I just had a couple of other um, amendments to the amendment, which I think might also be an amendment. Um, that weren't reflected in here, and I'll just go from the top down. We can consider, we can consider all of them, or consider each one of them rather than all of them all at once, if that's right. Um, under number four, I wanted to add um, at the end the words except over the entrance. Um, otherwise, I think we'll have a problem if we have to have architectural screening. Um, over the entrance to the parking area. So you you move to add the word except over the entrance to item four. Yes. For a second. Second. Motion on a second. Any discussion? Uh, that. Uh, if I could just ask Miss uh, Miss Huth a question, the do you actually mean over the entrance or? You mean like, covering the entrance? So in other words, you're, you don't want a garage door to be required, right? Okay. So just allow that there be, but the remainder of the foundation be architecturally screened from the surrounding area. I guess the word "over" doesn't. Except in front of the entrance. Yeah. Is that what you mean? It's fine. It's in front of. Yeah. Okay. Accept that. Okay. Okay. Further discussion? <coughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Ms. Huth? Okay. Um, the next one, I had, um, it's letter E. I had discussed this with, with, with Ms. Wyman, um, and the wording that's reflected on here, I'm not sure actually um, reflects what the intent was when I spoke with her. And what I wanted for E to say was that the height was equal to the average of immediately adjacent buildings within one story so that if you had um, you know two-story buildings on either side of a lot and somebody wanted to put up a single-family one ranch style house that that would be allowed well so that wording doesn't so are you suggesting a specific change or yeah, is well, this wording saying this height consistent with the immediately adjacent buildings I'm not sure what consistent with means. Mayor said it. Uh, yeah, Ms. Wyman. If I can explain that, um, one of the emails I got in response to the proposals um, was from, uh, actually I don't know where he lives, um, but from a gentleman who, who apparently knows a lot about these sorts of issues in architecture. Um, and he was concerned with the, the proposal as it originally was height equal to the average of the immediately adjacent buildings that, um, that equal to how, how specific are we going to be that it has to be um, exactly equal or uh, very supposed to be. So he had um, suggested something like that height falls between the heights of adjacent buildings that um, although he says that height is a vague concept um, the kind of building you seem to be preferring often has different sections at different heights and the total bulk of the building may seem taller or shorter based on gabling or orientation um, the idea with instead of using the word equal to consistent with would mean that there wouldn't be so much of a differential um, and I know with the 
what you had talked about with um, within one story. The problem, as I understand it, is that the height is measured in feet or perhaps meters, but not in, in the, the stories because it's, the stories could be at different heights. And so if we allow one story, but that story is very large, um, that that might not be consistent or, or close to uh, compatible with. Um, and so staff suggested the language that says consistent with so that it would be, uh, there wouldn't be such a variation um, perceived. Ms. Ms. Payne has something. I just wanted to add <coughs> clarification. In the zoning ordinance, there are restrictions on the height of buildings, and that's, um, and that's measured in feet, too. So, um, although, is it also, is it also in feet? No, no it's, it's all it's in feet. feet. feet so, and when people apply for variances on, on the, um, which they have and have been granted on height, um, the, it's also been a variance in terms of the number of feet. So I think I think your it, because item D talks about numbers of stories, which is a different concept. I think that's what's influencing your thoughts on it. But imagine D and E is two separate. Well, D and E are two separate things. And and again, this isn't a list of this isn't a checklist of things a building has to um, has to have to be approved. This is the of, of different kinds of factors they can look at. So one thing they could look at is stories, and another thing they could look at would be heights, and another thing they could look at would be windows, etc. I'm willing to let that one go, and if we need to change it later, come back to it. Um, I wanted to <clears throat> change, well, actually, I wanted to combine and then change um, letters I and J to say instead, no porches or balconies on second floor or higher on sides abutting single family residences. So. Was that a motion? Yes. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. That motion carries. Next one is uh, letter N, and this would be changed to read street facing doors onto balconies, patios, or porches. Be, and I might need some help here with somebody who's more architecturally inclined. French style only, <clears throat> parentheses, one or two doors, comma, paned and hinged, i.e. not sliding glass doors. <clears throat> so they, in other words, if I can speak to the um, motion. Um, Wait, you need a second, second for, for purpose uh, of discussion. Turn <clears throat> second. Um, that these be um, <clears throat> paned and hinged so that they open out or in um, rather than be the sliding glass, all one big pane um, types of doors. Is there any other discussion? Would you please read the words again? Sure. Um, street facing doors onto balconies, patios, or porches be French style only in parentheses one or two door um, and then pained and hinged um, and then in parentheses again not sliding glass door further discussion no further discussion all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed that motion carries Ms. Huth um, Um, I think I'm done with mine. I think Mr. Whalen might have one. Mr. Whalen? <clears throat> I have uh, a couple of motions. I have a couple of motions. Uh, one I would eliminate uh, for this at this point in time uh, the as asymmetrical design simply because it doesn't say any, nothing specific and is not really a good guideline. Okay, so your uh, motion is to eliminate a asymmetrical design. All right. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion a second. Mr. Whalen, do you want to speak to that motion? <coughs> no. uh, well, um, it's, I'm, con I, I'm not satisfied that asymmetrical design means anything specifically 
to a designer other than to say uh, one side will have three windows and one side will have two, one side will have a, a, cupola, a cupola and one side won't, will not, but there will be a different volume here and uh, no volume over here. And uh, so it's, it's, it's far too um, nebulous to uh, <coughs> any kind of a valid, valid uh, design criteria. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Ms. Wyman. Uh, just speaking against the motion, um, I think it actually does have significance. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have been proposed uh, in the in the um, staff memo or discussed so widely. Um, I have, Mr. Willing, you're the first person who has spoken against it or suggested that it has no significance. In fact, um, when you spoke with Mr. Ross, he had suggested, or maybe it was um, one of the other speakers uh, who, who spoke about it. The idea here is is to um, and the big boxes um, that that pollute the landscape. I think this uh, asymmetrical design, al along with others, um, others of these proposals and, and others that will be proposed in the future, um, will help to continue the character uh, uh, and the look of um, of the neighborhoods of West Urbana uh, in the MOR district. Thank you. Further discussion, Ms. Pat. I think, <clears throat> thank you. Just briefly, uh, um, again, if if these were all required, then that uh, Mr. Wayland's concern would be one that we should pay attention to because um, it should be clear what what is meant by that. But just like the previous motion, Ms. Huth made about the French doors and all that, these are ideas. This this is think of you're going to build a building in the MOR district, and you and you want to come up with a design that will. Um, Past the um, Development Review Board, here's a list of different things that can help make your building um, fit in with everything else around. Pick some. And someone who can't deal with the conservation symmetrical design can just pass off that over that one down to something else on the list. Um, but basically, asymmetrical means not symmetrical. So if one side is not just like the other one, then it's asymmetrical. And that doesn't necessarily mean it'll look nice, but it's one, one design feature that can be used and might be helpful to the design. That's all. Mr. Whalen. Uh, yes, yeah, so I. You know, I could say. Uh, first of all, it's like what I've heard. Uh, something here is better than nothing, and that doesn't strike me as good common sense. I. I think. Uh, and to say that because these things aren't mandated, that doesn't make any difference. You know, we put that in or we don't. We could say, if you wanted to. A juxtaposition of masses, volumes, and design elements that are not equal in importance. Mm -hmm. Could say that. That's much more specific than to say asymmetrical design. So that's why I make the motion, and I would uh, propose that we replace it with just that: a juxtaposition of volumes and masses, or design elements that are unequal in importance. I'll accept that amendment to the motion as a. So <coughs> you change the motion to um, uh, change A from asymmetrical design to the wording that you... Um, the juxtaposition of volumes and masses or design elements which are not equal in importance. Okay. I don't know if you can... So we have a, a, a motion, or that's the motion and second. Is there any discussion? If, if you would add that in addition to asymmetrical design as another as another one on the list, I'd support that. I just think that that might be more confusing to some people than asymmetrical. Further discussion? You know, uh, to say, though, that we have to include this uh, asymmetrical, I don't care. If you want to say asymmetrical, fine, then include it, but then include the more specific design con concept. Why don't, why don't we just include Joe's comment as the second sentence of A, asymmetrical design, juxtaposition of masses. I stated, Joe. Juxtaposition of masses and vo or volumes, masses and volumes, or design elements, so that uh, they are not equal in importance. Okay, so that's now the, um, the, uh, the motion is to change A and add that language to it, leaving asymmetrical design in. And, and, including the uh, language that Mr. Whalen uh, 
has said <laughs> numerous times. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Mr. Whalen, anything else? Uh, yes, um, if you will. You know, some of these that are ambiguous are, I find, uh, quite acceptable uh, retention of trees. You don't talk about specific trees, where, the, how many trees, provided they don't get in the way of the foundation or the plumbing or uh, green space in front yard. That's an ambiguity, too, that is uh, a valid. Uh, um, but uh, so I, I'm not critical of this for all its ambiguity, ambiguities. I'm just thinking of what maybe we can be a little more specific. And it's very hard. If you notice in our conversation here tonight, we're, we're sort of talking uh, this way on this side and that side of, a, of a, an issue or an idea, and that's legislating on the floor. And it's not, it's not a good idea. Very cumbersome, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, particularly when you're dealing with something as, as ethereal as uh, aesthetics. But uh, I would say uh, the articulation of the structure, that is uh, element here, Q, element Q. In that we say, in design without gables, and I like Ms. Lyman's employment, employing the word use, use, use dormers or other features along the front side to improve, uh, oh, excuse me, use dormers or other features along the front facade and to there. break up the front plane or roof line of the structure, to break up the front plane or roof line of the structure. Is there a second for that? Second. Motion to second any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Mr. Whalen. No, thank you. I think uh, else? that's all. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Mr. Otto? Well, I got uh, one su suggestion, and um, that is I'm all in favor of the use of natural materials. Uh, <coughs> One of the things that I've noticed, is, though, um, walking around town, cedar shake, shim, sh cedar shake shingles on a well-maintained and attractive structure can be nice, but if our concern about rental properties is that sometimes they aren't maintained very well, suggest that be a, a positive element may be contrary uh, to what we're trying to accomplish since I don't necessarily think that there are low maintenance type of natural material. So if there's no objection, I would uh, suggest that we just remove that, say, wood brick uh, or stucco, et cetera, versus vinyl siding. So moved. Second. I have a motion, a second. Any discussion? There's no discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Discussion on the main motion or on this this uh, amendment? This is the, the design guidelines review is what's before us? Okay. Uh, Ms. Wyman? Yeah, just uh, to thank council members for their input. Um, I hate to imagine how long it would have taken if we wouldn't have brought any, wouldn't, if Esther and I wouldn't have put anything in the packet. So um, maybe we cut down about 10 hours from that. <laughs> um, but I think this council member input, the public input um, on these proposals, I think makes it a lot stronger um, and provides a stronger base from which the Development Review Board can start um, as soon as they're named. Thanks. As, <clears throat> Ms. Huth. I don't have any changes. I just have an, a lingering inquiry, and that was, I, I don't know if we got an answer to what rusticated bases. Mr. Kowalski? Um, I can only guess myself, but I think it is <laughs> Good. where you have the bottom of the house, maybe the last piece of siding on the house, and then you have the foundation that shows for an extra foot and a half or two foot. Is that the intention? A brick foundation. <laughs> that's that's my understanding, I suppose. From the Historic Preservation Commission. Yeah, so you don't have, 
you know, vinyl siding row after row that goes completely down and just ground. ends at the at the ground. You have the elements of a foundation. All right. Everyone okay with that definition? <laughs> you, are you including vinyl siding then? Uh, not as a no. natural material. No. no. That was not, not meant. prohibiting it, but it's. Any other discussion on the um, motion to include uh, design guidelines? Question, Mayor. Yes, Mr. Whalen. Will, if we come up with some ideas that might improve this um, and fine tune it perhaps or something we didn't catch or think about, will we have a chance to? Uh, well, the idea was that these design guidelines would follow and, um, you know, we're, we're working on it and that it'll come, you know, after the holidays, but then go through the process of, um, you know, going through the Historic Preservation Commission, Plan Commission, and then to us. And so, you know, <clears throat> I would suggest that, you know, once we've got these in place, change them every week until we get the permanent mm -hmm. ones in place. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that we do have permanent ones that are going to be uh, on the way just as soon as we can humanly get them done. Well, I didn't mean to change them, uh, you know, uh, willy-nilly and uh, at a whim. I just thought if we see something outstanding that might... Well, if it is, it would have to be, you know, a pretty major, you know, bearing omission or something like that. Um, you know, because I think what we've got is some, you know, guidelines that we can work with. They're not meant to be, uh, you know, in place for the long term, and we will have a chance, you know, in the next few months to, to uh, address permanent guidelines. Mr. Mayor, yeah, yeah. for a minute. Um, we talked a little bit about this two weeks ago, but um, the essence of the guidelines will be basically this list. They'll just be illustrated a lot more and described a lot more in something that's very user-friendly, very easy to see and understand. Um, give a lot of examples from the Green Street and Elm Street corridors of how all these elements currently exist in, that, in those areas and um, just give more description. So I think this is a really good, this is, a, this is what the design guidelines will be and there may be an opportunity to a little bit as we start seeing some examples. So um, I think if there's any ideas, let us know and we'll, but, but you will be seeing them again. Any other discussion on this motion? Wyman? Sorry, just one other question, uh, perhaps better directed to staff. Um, with the emails that I've received and I'm sure other council members have received or will receive or members of the public who have suggestions, should those just go straight to you or Dr. Tyler? Either or, forward on to staff, either or is fine, myself okay. or Libby. Thank you. Thanks. Any further discussion on the amendment, uh, Mr. Otto? Yeah. I uh, would just say I'll go ahead and, and uh, vote in favor of the amendment. I do hope that um, Planning Commission uh, will move with alacrity to go ahead and propose some, uh, some permanent guidelines so that we can uh, have something in place with the benefit of their input. Um, you know, looking at that set of uh, guidelines, at least to my untrained uh, eye, uh, there may be glaring <laughs> omissions there that, that I can't spot or, or, you know, parts of that are unworkable, but it seems good to me. One of the things I would be interested in hearing the Planning Commission address is to go ahead and uh, whether it's practical to make the use of natural materials on the exterior uh, mandatory. I do think that that is uh, something that will help, will go a long ways towards preserving the character uh, of the neighborhood and also uh, creating an area that has positive multiple, multi-residential uh, uh, as opposed to uh, something that is, is negative. Uh, for the neighborhood, so um, I hope that's something that the Planning Commission and others can address. Any further discussion on this amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please come by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Back to the main motion, Ms. Chenoweth. Um, I have an additional 
I have a uh, amendment to the main motion. Um, and if council members look at page five of the ordinance, um, I will be speaking about uh, section three, <coughs> and then <coughs> section three, section eight dash three J, location of parking facilities. Um, currently, if you look at the top of page five, it says. A parking located below principal structure shall be allowed in the MOR district in accordance with Article 8 of this ordinance and the provisions of the MOR design guidelines as provided for in Section 1112J. Um, I would like to add a sentence after that which says, uh, it, it's a clarifying sentence. It says, if parking is located below a principal residential structure, all rental units on the floor above the parking shall be wheelchair accessible and located along an accessible route. So say, the language is, say that again. yeah, I'll repeat. Um, this would be a the second sentence in J on the top of page five. If parking is located below a principal residential structure, comma, all residential units on the floor above the parking shall be wheelchair accessible and located along an accessible route. Second. Um, I can explain. Okay. Uh, the, there's been some actually misunderstanding. I'm, I'm not sure because um, I haven't sat down and thought of all the ways in which you could have submerged parking and not <coughs> meet accessibility requirements, federal accessibility requirements. Um, but in the confusion around this issue of what partially submerged parking means for accessible units, I'm offering a clarification to the ordinance that makes it, it, it clear that when there is, if you have a principally residential structure, so we're not talking about an, a, an office or retail structure, which would also be allowed. If you have residents in the area, uh, the Fair Housing Act actually requires that there be accessible units. So. The, the, the goal is to show that all rental units on the floor above parking shall be wheelchair accessible means that, um, that there will be accessible units on that first floor above submerged parking will be accessible. And there's been a lot of confusion over whether or not, you know, that would happen de facto or not. But to bring this ordinance, uh, to, to, to clarify, to make sure there's no uh, misconceptions, and I know that there's been a history of developers um, developing and then having to retrofit for accessibility purposes. We don't want to have that both from the developer standpoint and from the from those who need accessible housing and from the city standpoint we want to make of what 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 we are requiring in terms of accessibility. Um, and so I'm proposing this language to help clarify that and make it very clear to anyone who's developing that the uh, first floor units would be accessible above submerged parking and that they're, they're not exempt from that. Um, the, requir the requirement of an accessible unit, this would require that every unit be accessible. Usually if one unit is accessible, uh, market forces would say they would all be accessible because you wouldn't just have an elevator that privately goes into an individual unit. But in theory, you could do that. So um, we're making sure that, that we have accessible housing in units with partially submerged parking. Any other discussion? <coughs> I have a question um, for staff. Um, would this effectively um, eliminate any parking below the structures? It seems to me that then that would, I mean, the, the size of these buildings, which is not that great, would then require an elevator, which are not normally put in buildings of this size at all. My guess is what you're going to see then is nobody will put parking below the building. So if that's the intent, that, that no no one would would make, um, you know, would, would put an elevator in what would be a one or two story building, a two story, you know, a two story building. I just don't think that would happen. Mayor Smith, if I can ask it. Um, I can give you an example of a building that has submerged parking and an accessible first floor above it. Um, it's it's not the best building to give us an example of anything because it's one where um, five years ago our housing inspector had to close down all the balconies because they were 
unsafe. But it, but it, so so I'm not putting this forward. Is it's anything else other than where you drive down to get into the parking lot and you go up a ramp to the floor to the first residential floor, which is above the parking lot and, ha and the building has no elevator, and that's 905 907 West Oregon, which you probably pass numerous times because you live pretty close to it. There's um, <coughs> it's it's that three tone beige building. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm not presenting as an example of anything other than, in fact, the first floor apartments are accessible. There is a long ramp from from the sidewalk to the end. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the ramp goes the length of the building so that the uh, the, the um, degree of incline is, uh, meets requirements. And, um, and in fact, the parking's underground and the first floor apartments are accessible and on an accessible route because there's um, there's a ramp. And there, there, probably, there are, I think, are a couple of other buildings like that in the Champaign campus area, but that this one is close to where I live and, and I pass it on my way to work a lot. So it's doable. You don't have to have an elevator to make the first floor accessible. It's just if you if we don't require it, then we get what, what um, the Pritchards were talking about and what we've discussed here before is you've got a first floor parking lot or an underground parking lot and you've got two little apartments stuck in there or one apartment actually I think by the federal law that's all they need. We require two so they put two apartments in the, in the garage basically and the door opens out right into the garage and they're not even, you know, they're just on each end of the garage are two apartments and then the rest of the building is inaccessible. If you didn't allow parking under the building, the entire first floor would be accessible uh, because that is required by, by the federal fair housing law. So it would have to be. Um, so this is basically saying go ahead and put the parking in but you still have to make the first floor accessible just as though there were no parking underneath the building, which is possible and we have at least one example of it in Urbana. Yeah, I, I, you know, knowing the difference between the scale of uh, that particular building and the scale that you could build on Green Street, which these ones on Green Street uh, or in the MOR would be substantially smaller than that. I just don't think that that's going to be a, a, a feasible design structure or design possibility. And that what this, what your amendment is uh, requiring is elevator access to the to the second floor, which. Uh, I think would be cost prohibitive. And so if you want to eliminate all parking below the structure, then this is a good amendment. If you don't, then it's not. Gentlemen? I, um, to respond, the, we have a lot of pictures in our heads, and one of the pictures that we have is um, building on stilts. And, and when we have building on stilts, that means then we have some accessible units um, by our as per our ordinance on the same ground level mm -hmm. as the parking is. Um, we have at least one instance on ca in Campus Town of fully submerged park. Um, I don't know what they did in terms of accessibility there. Um, <coughs> on, I believe it's Nevada. Uh, would be west of Lincoln. No, it'd be Oregon, west of Lincoln. Uh, fully submerged parking and I don't know if there's accessible units in there or not. Um, but the but we're talking about partially submerged parking. So to actually meet our requirements, <coughs> we would be creating basement apartments that are considered accessible apartments. That's because they would be partially submerged in, in the ground. Um, and I throughout this conversation, I have been thinking that that's that's not what partially submerged parking would. There would not be any apartments on the same level as parking these kind of basement apartments in the ground um, that would then meet accessibility requirements. And perhaps I'm wrong, and maybe that's a question of staff. Is that is that what we've been thinking? If we were <coughs> staff proposed partially submerged parking, and we have a certain accessibility requirement. So throughout, have we been thinking that means two basement apartments, accessible units that are basically basement apartments well, in the ground? The proposal wasn't to allow partially submerged parking. It was to allow parking under. So um, again, going back to two weeks ago, the, the thought was more of maybe the back half of a building at grade level, not submerged at all, um, could be a garage style type of parking underneath the building and maybe then there's two units that are facing the street that are at grade level and mm -hmm. would of course be accessible. Um, that was the proposed change to the ordinance to allow to allow parking underneath the structure, not necessarily specifically to allow partially submerged parking. 
I guess there could be um, a scenario maybe given the lot or given the topography if um, maybe a lot slopes down a little bit and, and you enter a parking from the rear and it's partially submerged but yet the front of the building is still pretty much at grade um, you know you could have that but okay. I think the mayor's point is probably probably pretty good that um, considering the the FAR requirements um, in this district uh, I don't know if I could think of many examples of four or five or six unit apartment buildings on stilts for the you know, to, to get more parking or to get more apartments. I mean, you see it more with the much, much higher density buildings, which is not possible in the district. Mm -hmm. So it's my understanding, just as from, from the staff's memo and the conversations, that um, that apartments on stilts is not allowed within the MOR, within our amendments and within the existing ordinance. That you can't have parking, although it be it screened, on the whole first floor and then resident on the way up. I, I, my understanding The requirement as it's written is there's, there shall be no parking permitted underneath the structure. I, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but there's no parking underneath the structure. So and whether then, it's underground or partially underground or at grade. But then in the, uh, I, I, I'm at a loss for exactly where this is because I was uh, working with it before. In the um, amendment that we are, that is now before us, the amendment staff's suggestion is to allow partially submerged parking. Yeah, essentially, yeah. It's, it's too oh, low the parking amendment. below the structure, but yeah, that's the piece. But then within the provisions of Article Eight of this ordinance, it, it would allow submer partially submerged or fully submerged parking. It would yes. allow partially submerged, fully submerged, yeah. and apartment on stilts. Right. And so, um, okay, I'm I am I'm really confused then because my reading of the of the conversation and the staff memo is is way off. My understanding was that we were looking at allowing partially submerged parking. I I, I have a suggestion, and I don't know how how what this would look like, but. Um, I think that the the issue of parking um, and the way in which parking is treated is um, could we could go ahead with the amendments as written and and then address that at a later time simply because I have a series of questions and I don't think it's appropriate to work out the questions on the council floor I'm working under a set of assumptions uh -huh. that are just not true so I would like to withdraw my motion um, and I guess I would like to ask uh, staff if there would be a possibility to then couple our conversations um, about design criteria <coughs> next year with uh, also potential amendments to uh, the MOR zoning that address parking and then I just I need to have further conversations with council members and staff. Uh, Mr. Otto? Yeah. I would just um, I guess also as a comment say you know I think accessibility is an important thing it's something that the council uh, is obviously concerned with uh, although we're not willing to allow people to build accessible sidewalks in some areas of town but we are concerned about accessibility and uh, one of the things that we ought to maybe think about in instead of just sort of pure regulation is how can we put incentives in place that would make the whole building accessible in other words make it economically feasible to just build an elevator that would go up and I don't know it is that <coughs> a three stories or four stories where you get a number of units you'd have to adjust OSR and that sort of thing but then instead of settling floor that's accessible you have a whole apartment building that's accessible accessibility in the kind that everybody here uh, would love to see in a perfect world We've got the main motion in front of us. Is there any discussion? Ms. Pat? I'd like to clarify um, what it was Mrs. Chen with withdrawing the motion I that I seconded? Yeah. Okay. So now we are, we, if we pass this tonight, we will allow buildings on stilts. We will allow underground parking. We will allow partially underground parking. And we are not going to provide for apartments that are accessible except um, 
the, the degree to which federal law requires it, which is um, shove a couple in the garage. That's that's what we have before us right now. Is that? Yeah, simply because I, I don't think it's possible to work out a solution on the council floor to this unless we'd like to defer the entire amendment mm -hmm. at this point. <laughs> I thought the motion. I thought the, the motion did that well. Um, I don't. I don't know that I would vote against this whole thing because of it. But I just. I yes. wish that. Pardon me. Yeah. Yeah. I know. We pass it. It's going to be screened. If you if you use a wheelchair, you can't live there. But it will be screened. How nice. Um, I, I, I. There is such a serious lack of, of of accessible housing for people with disabilities in this community, and. Um, the only, I mean, we can talk about incentives and you know, all these things that we wish would happen. What, what little we have is, is the legal requirement um, that Urbana was rather late uh, catching up with in terms of our own housing codes. Uh, and if you, have, if you have a building built in the MRR district now, the first floor has to be accessible. And with this new ordinance, we're taking that away. We are reducing opportunities for accessible housing for people with disabilities by passing this. Um, and so I think that is um, unnecessary and shameful. And I hate it. So there any further discussion? Yes, well, I have another motion. Um, and uh, that is changing the subject. Uh, uh, this is on uh, back to your minutes. If you look at your minutes from two weeks ago, page five. Um, <coughs> the uh, last full paragraph on the page. This is uh, move to amend the ordinance, uh, section 2B, to add in cases where proposed additions and or remodeling efforts are so extensive as to result in substantial change to the appearance and or scale of an existing building, the zoning administrator shall make this determination and shall then request development review board review and approval of the project. The Development Review Board shall have the ability to make adjustments to existing codes and regulations for adaptive reuse projects for such projects as set forth in Section 2D below. Second. <coughs> Motion a second. Is there any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor? Saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Back to the main motion. Any other discussion? It's Ms. Chenoweth. I'm going to request that the um, that the uh, discussion of parking be put on as a discussion item on the committee of the whole next week. Um, and so I wanted to clarify to council members I'll be supporting the motion that's on the floor. And I also feel strongly that the that the parking piece of the conversation has not been worked out, and and so we should move to move fairly rapidly in, in addressing that issue. Any further discussion? Ms. Wyman. Yeah. Um, I would like to move the motion that um, Ms. Chenoweth moved and withdrew um, that was stated for page section J. Uh, if parking is located bef below a principal residential structure, all rental units on the floor above the parking shall be wheelchair accessible and located along an accessible route. So moved. Second. A motion, a second, discussion, Ms. Wyman. To speak to the motion, I understand that there are concerns about what um, what can't be allowed, what could be allowed, that uh, parking on, that, uh, that a building on stilts um, would be still allowed in the, in the MOR district uh, and those sorts of issues. I think that if, that by, if we pass this um, proposal, or if we pass the uh, MOR, changes without such a motion as the one um, that I'm proposing now that Ms. Chenoweth had worked out the wording on, um, then again, we are reducing the amount of accessible um, how accessible housing. Uh, new is basically seems like the only area where we can get more, more accessible housing. And um, we don't want to eliminate that opportunity here in the MOR district. If there are concerns about uh, compatibility about um, does this just eliminate parking altogether or that sort of thing, although we do have an example in Urbana um, that is allowed. 
We can bring that up with the design guideline reviews, with the development review board to discuss this. We can discuss it next week as well. I think it's important. I'd like to try to get this uh, in the main motion uh, so that it's part of the wording again. So if we see proposals um, next week that come from a developer, we're not going to see a reduction uh, in the opportunities for building affordable housing in Urbana. Chairman. I uh, obviously support the sentiment of the motion because it was originally a motion I made, um, but I, I can't support it without um, studying the issue further. And so if council members um, object to uh, m me studying the, the issue further before voting, then that's the way it will be, and, and they will get a no vote from me. Pat? I propose the way to um, to have the opportunity, to create that opportunity would be to remove the entire Section J until such time as we can um, have further discussion about this. And that would be to maintain the status quo in the MR, MOR district that we don't allow parking <coughs> in the buildings. I like um, oh. But I made that motion two weeks ago, and it didn't pass. I don't know if the rules prohibit me from doing it, but I, I think they do. So, But if anyone would like to try that approach instead, um, uh, someone else can, um, can move to reconsider if they're going to change their vote. We could take all of J out, then we wouldn't need this, the, the current motion on the floor. And at a later date, we can um, revisit the issue of, of, of facilitating a way to allow parking under buildings um, that might uh, satisfy concerns. A point of personal privilege? <laughs> Ms. Wyman. Uh, so if one uh, um, mayor or perhaps Mr. Holtz um, or someone else um, more familiar with the rules. Uh, if someone were someone who um, voted no on Ms. Pat's proposal to remove J, Section J two weeks ago, that would have been Mr. Otto, Ms. Huth, or Ms. Chenoweth, um, moves to reconsider can, because for the intention of changing their vote, then we could bring this motion back. Is that correct? I believe if one of them brought it forward, they could they could um, vote on it. The, <coughs> the one thing, I, and talking about this parking, you know, and, and to make a statement after we've just gone through all the desi design guidelines and all of the uh, criteria that mandate that these uh, buildings would be compatible with the uh, surrounding neighborhood, to suggest that a building on stilts will be allowed and get through the DRB is ludicrous. And so some of the, the, the arguments that are being made here are uh, the purpose of them is to incite fear uh, and are not based in reality. So. Uh, I think what uh, Ms. Chenoweth was suggesting earlier is that we don't have enough uh, information to understand this fully is probably right on target. Um, and I would suggest that uh, we take her approach, leave the thing as it is, and bring it back uh, for further discussion if it needs it. Uh, but um, Ms. Ms. Yes, Ms. Mr. Otto. Yeah. I just, uh, you know, I remember very early on in my council career, I was always in a hurry uh, to get things done, and I would get frustrated when people wanted to take time and make sure they understood things and get more input, and I've changed my view on it. And unfortunately, I think the council has moved away from that. I think, um, you know, Ms. Chenoweth has uh, a good faith question, and it's not very collegial after she's withdrawn the motion to then go ahead and bring it forward and say, well, we want to, you know, force the council uh, to consider it anyways. If a council member needs more time uh, to consider something and to make sure that they're accomplishing what they're trying to accomplish, then I think that we should be willing uh, to, you know, allow for that. And, and make sure that we're making a good decision. It's just the nature of uh, collegiality and having a good faith uh, public discussion and one that's constructive uh, instead of uh, based purely on counting votes and trying to figure out uh, who's going to win on a particular issue. <clears throat> Ms. Pat. I would like to give you more time to think about it. If you take the position of I need more time to think about it, so can we maintain the status quo and not make any change in the law until we've had more time to think about it? I would support that. But what you're asking is, can we change the law and think about it later? And I don't think that's wise. I wish 
I wish if people have questions that they would say, hey, we don't have to rush this through tonight. We don't have to rush through allowing parking under buildings if people have serious concerns about the ramifications of that. And I'm not trying to scare anyone. It's just it's just a matter of fact what it says in there is that you can have you can have parking below the building. And if you're saying to me, it's it's just like the point of all this. If you're saying, oh no, but that means that they'll still have to have the apartments upstairs. Great, put that in writing. That the, the apartments have to be upstairs. But if you won't put it in writing, then that makes me think it doesn't have to be done. Uh, and my experience has been often that things don't get done because they weren't put in writing. So um, I, and I don't know that people understand this completely what what it is you're deciding. But I don't want to um, make the radical change now a change that personally I think should never brought forward but make that now and then worry later about how to fix it how about we just put the whole thing off and then um, on, on the subject of parking under the building and then we can hopefully get it right when we look at it again with the design criteria in the spring and if not I discussion on, on the motion, motion uh, on the amendment Ms. Chenoweth if uh, Ms. Wyman was willing to withdraw her motion I would make a motion uh, to reconsider uh, so I, I make the motion, or I withdraw my motion. Okay, that motion's withdrawn. Ms. Chenoweth? Motion to reconsider uh, deleting a section 3, pages 4 and 5 of the proposed ordinance. Read section 3-3J, parking located below a principal structure shall be allowed in the MOR but district in accordance with the provisions of Article 8 of this ordinance and the provisions of the MOR design guidelines as provided for in Section 1112J. Second. Motion a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. That motion carries. Back to the main motion. Any other discussion? Mr. Otto. I came here fully prepared to support these amendments tonight, but I just simply can't uh, go forward with this. Time and time again, we're told you have to vote on something now, you have to vote on it tonight, and if uh, you're not sure of it, then you have to come back later and propose uh, some kind of a change. And uh, I don't think that's the right way to conduct uh, public business, particularly uh, not something that's as complex and interrelated as a major revision to the MOR district. And so, uh, in spite of to vote yes for these amendments, I'm going to vote no uh, because I think that we've been poorly served uh, by this public process. Further comments? Ms. Wyman? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that um, uh, two weeks ago when, when I was set to consider this, or to vote on this um, final proposal, Mr. Otto suggested we wait two weeks um, because you need to consider this. It's not something I'm used to, but it's something okay, that's okay. It's part of the council rules that we can defer it and discuss it for two weeks. At that point, we had no design guidelines um, for review or for the commission. Um, it's something that has been changed. It's something that uh, Ms. Pat and I included in council members' packets so that it could begin discussion so that we wouldn't have to legislate on the floor um, and on the fly um, uh, tonight. And that's something that was the intention. Um, if council members are concerned about having things put in front of them on the same day or having to propose things on the same day, I wish they would do it. They would would respond to the letters to the suggestions that are included in the council members' packets. Now, Ms. Huth, Ms. Chenoweth, Mr. Hayes, Ms. Pat, uh, all did that. I just think that if you're going to say, "Don't wait till you get to the council floor to make these changes," we ought to be prepared to when a council member calls the day before, the night before, um, and says, "Do you got any questions?" and provides you with their home number, their work number, their email to say if you got proposed, if you got suggestions, concerns. Uh, any ideas, let me know that this is something, a conversation that should take place um, among council members and at least with these design guideline reviews um, that didn't happen with all the council members and so if we need to adjust the time we spend or or talk, have, schedule something for committee, the time it's introduced at council from plan commission and then deferred, we can do that but I think that um, if we wait until the night that it's um, up for a vote and it's the moratorium is set to expire uh, at the end of the week and then say ask questions like well can we even propose this is this even legal rather than you know asking the makers of the motion or asking staff to look at this beforehand 
I think we're setting ourselves up for exactly the problem that Mr. Otto has has set concerns for. I think there are ways to address this um, that allow everyone to feel part of the process and be a part of the process, and that is in um, discussing issues with other council members when those proposals are put in their packet and before we come to the council floors. Um, and while this is not an ideal situation that we've um, incurred tonight, I think that we've had uh, discussion and uh, I think that it's been um, led to some really positive results, results that have included Mr. Whalen's motions. Um, I think Mr. Otto's made some suggestions as well that have passed. Um, it's been a, a council effort, and um, uh, it's been a lot of work for staff, for Plan Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, um, and council as well. But I think it's ended up with the um, with an end result that's good, perhaps not the ideal of what every council member, each council member wants, because I don't think that, that you could have one proposal that ends up being a unanimous decision on any legislative body. But I think it's generally a positive and something that um, we can certainly make changes to in the future, um, but, but ends up being, um, I think, a, overall a, a very good thing. Thank you. Any other comments, <clears throat> Mr. Whalen? Just a small one. I tried to call you today. I didn't get your message until this morning. I was at the hospital last night when you called. And so I, I, do, I did try to reach you. It's good to have your lively discussion back. Thank you. We missed it. <clears throat> Any other discussion? If there's no other discussion, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Hooth? Yes. Mr. Otto? No. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? No. Ms. Wyman? Yes. Motion carries with five eyes. We've had a um, request for a short break. Yeah. So I think basically the substance is, uh, is well, I'm sure that the substance is exactly the same as what we had before, just uh, some, some little bit more wordsmithing there on the termination provisions. You will note as well attached to that uh, what I had referred to last week, uh, uh, the RFP, which is, uh, which is uh, called Attachment A in the uh, Preliminary Feasibility Study Agreement. I do have that attached now here tonight. It was not there last week, and I promised that it would be here I want to point out that this remains a draft RFP. We're still working on it. We're still tweaking it. Uh, and it, it's bulky, but um, most of it is boilerplate RFP type of language. The juicy stuff is uh, at the scope um, and the specifications at section 2, page 8. If you want to have a look at that, under the heading description of work, um, basically, there's a paragraph A with some subparts and a paragraph B with some subparts. Uh, you'll remember when, uh, when I discussed this last week and uh, said what I expected the scope of work in the proposal, said that it would focus basically on three things. <clears throat> One is uh, just analysis of the current utility system and, and uh, the electric system to see how it could be improved and what it needed and what kind of changes it would take. Um, and that that was for the purpose both of dealing with the ICC process where we have the informal complaint pending before the ICC as well as for uh, for investigating the um, the possibility of an acquisition either by agreement or by <clears throat> by eminent domain I also said that uh, the third point would be um, that we would look at the issues of aggregation and uh, how we could make those kinds of things kind of a, a halfway step um, uh, towards uh, uh, getting what we need to get out of the utility here uh, and that that would be part of the RFP. Aggregation is not expressly mentioned here but it shows up um, under B5 which is on page 9 under other possible courses of action and I think that's partly where we're going to do some some adjusting here as well um, just to make sure that that's clear uh, to anybody who submits a proposal that that would be uh, in there. So uh, my point is that what you have before you tonight uh, really is the ordinance itself um, and the proposed uh, agreement that the RFP is something that uh, that we desire some flexibility on yet and I think that the ordinance itself um, uh, uh, talks about um, the 
intergovernmental agreement and the RFP being in substantially uh, this form, and so I think that gives us the flexibility that we need to do the, the um, tweaking on there. But essentially, that's what we're looking at. Any questions? No questions. Uh, motion would be in order. So moved. Second. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just for the, for the record, is that the yeah, I think Ms. Huth already made a motion. It was seconded, and then I pointed out there were some amendments. So if we could clarify so which motion. The understanding that uh, the motion meant uh, the latest version of this ordinance. It just so happens that was what I moved. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Any, there's no discussion. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Chenoweth? Discussion. Uh, hand is up. Chenoweth? I just want to make a statement, which is that um, I applaud the administration for moving forward with this. Um, intergovernmental agreement um, to look into the feasibility of establishing our we have we have uh, layers of problems here we not only have a history of, of um, poor service with Illinois power um, and some some really serious consequences uh, to that service um, we've also seen an escalation of fees um, in, in the uh, rates and we um, have tried to help out. We actually ab uh, abated part of our taxes, uh, utility taxes, for a period of time when uh, during some of the coldest months simply because we had residents who were really facing tremendous energy bills because it was both cold, the rates were high, and the um, and uh, the, what we could do was to provide some kind of tax relief. We also have a utility assistance program. Now, if we had control over our own utility. There's all kinds of things we could do. Uh, we would not have to pay market rates for a utility assistance program. We're paying we're paying profit rates for utility assistance. If we owned our own municipal utility, we wouldn't have to do that. Um, we would be have a lot more control over rates, so that instead of us abating taxes, we'd actually be able to fluctuate rates um, based on on um, uh, you know the the circumstances of the of the hour. Um, and so, I uh, although I don't. You know, necessarily think that the community is is ready, or that we are financially. The, the idea of a municipal utility is kind of a financially viable option. I certainly support us looking into it, um, <coughs> and I believe that um, because we have that here, um, we have there's a possibility of of um, it being feasible for us to own the distribution of power and the kind of control that that would give our community um, in a situation, in, a, in an environment which is extremely um, unwieldy um, in the midst of deregulation. I think at some point the Republicans are going to figure out that their deregulation idea was a ma major fiasco for the residential and business community. Um, they haven't admitted that yet publicly, but um, in the meantime, uh, you know, either we're going to have increased regulation and back to some sanity and stability, or we're going to really have to take power into our own hands and to have some local control over um, our tree trimming, our rates, our uh, level of service and quality of service, etc. So I strongly support this, um, and I, you know, I applaud the administration for. I know that you all, uh, Mr. Holtz. Every time I interact with him, he is running off to work on the IP issue. So I, I know he's putting a lot of time in this, and, and uh, I thank him for that. Further discussion? Further discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Shinoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Hooth? Yes. Mr. Otto? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Wyman? Yes. The motion carries with seven ayes. Uh, Ms. Hooth? Next up, we have item um, E1, B1. Uh, um, we can probably take all the traffic commission items together if you right. want. One, two, three, and four, then. Ordinance number 2003-11-123, an ordinance amending Schedule J of Section 23-172 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code establishing curb loading zones on certain streets. New number two, ordinance number 2003-11-124, an ordinance L of Section 23-187 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code prohibiting parking so by places, Florida Avenue, Philo Road, Central Avenue, Briggs Street. Number three, ordinance number 2003-11-125, an ordinance amending Schedule H of Section 23-93 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code requiring stop signs at certain intersections, Adams, Streets at Briar, Adams Street at Briarcliff Drive, Central Avenue, Briggs. 
Item number four, ordinance number 2003-11-126, an ordinance amending schedule I of section 23-94 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code, requiring yield signs at certain intersections, Adams Street at Briarcliff, Drive Motion, is there a second? Second. second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? There's no discussion. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Ms. Huth? Yes. Mr. Otto? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Wyman? Yes. Motion.